something from the government. How is C-SPAN funded? 30 years ago, America's cable companies created C-SPAN as a public service, a private business initiative. No government mandate, no government money. And now a House hearing with top administration health officials on the swine flu outbreak. Frank Pallone of New Jersey chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Health. From yesterday, this is about two and a half hours. Meeting of the subcommittee is called to order. Today we're having a hearing on 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak and the U.S. federal response. I have to warn you, I have to get used to this uh, new definition and not use swine flu, I understand anymore. Um, the, the subcommittee is meeting to discuss the ongoing 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak and the U.S. federal response. And the purpose of today's hearing is to hear from our nation's leading agencies to learn the what, when, and where about this outbreak and also to discuss next steps in the federal response in reporting and reacting to this potential crisis. Today we have invited Rear Admiral W. Craig Vanderwagen, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, who is the Acting Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and Rear Admiral Ann Shuckett, who is Interim Deputy Director for the Science and Public Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to come and help educate Congress and the public about this very serious public health emergency and highlight areas where further support may be necessary. Now, let me tell my colleagues that because the witnesses are on the front line of our ongoing efforts to report and react to the 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak, I'm cognizant time is of the essence and they are needed at their respective offices. Therefore, I have asked all members of the committee to not give an opening statement, but instead submit their statements for the record so that we can get straight to our witnesses and make the best use of their limited time. Uh, without objection, members will have five days to submit their written statements for inclusion in the record hearing. I am going to recognize, though, the committee chair uh, and subcommittee chairs and the ranking members for, for remarks, and uh, we will begin with Mr. Deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, distinguished members of our panel. Uh, I think we all want to know how to evaluate and know where we are in the ongoing effort to respond to the H1N1 flu situation. And I appreciate the efforts of the, the chairman and the members of this subcommittee to give us this opportunity to hear update information on what is truly a dynamic and obviously rapidly changing situation. I recognize the importance of the roles that each of our witnesses play in responding to this public health threat, and so I'm going to keep my comments as brief as possible. Uh, I recall not too very long ago this uh, committee was having hearings when we were concerned about the bird flu. Uh, and many of the concerns and expressions of uh, preparation necessities that we talked about then, I'm sure, are applicable here today. Um, as our witnesses will attest, the, the threat of a global influenza epidemic or flu pandemic is one of the greatest public threats that we face today. From speaking with uh, experts in the field, both in this most recent as well as the most recent past uh, experience with this, we've all said it's not a question of if, a flu pandemic will hit, it's a question of when, and I suppose now, what strain will it be? Uh, and I believe that our responsibilities of, as members of Congress to ensure that the public is protected from this threat as soon as possible and that we take the necessary steps to mitigate its spread is, of course, uh, the heightened risk and is certainly something that's high on our priorities. And there's no silver bullet, we all know that, but we do want to know uh, what is being done, what should be done, what role can we play? I, encourage, I am encouraged by the rapid response of the federal and state authorities who are working closely in conjunction with the private sector to develop solutions to the flu situation that we are facing. In addition to these efforts, I think we have to continue to look for the vulnerabilities that leave the American public at risk. Uh, I 
have been told that this morning Vice President Joe Biden said in an interview that he'd advise members of his family to avoid commercial air travel, subways, and other locations where tra transmission of flu from person to person is easy. This seems somewhat contrary to the administration's recent statements, and I hope that we can clarify that in this hearing today. I also hope that we can see how the administration has looked at all available options in dealing with this matter. Uh, we certainly uh, need to know and how to advise our constituents with regard to uh, all of the issues of travel, uh, crossing our national boundaries, and all of the things that go with that. Uh, this is a very distinguished group, and I feel sure that you can answer these questions and many, many more. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Chairman Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. It seems to me that at this hearing, we uh, must accomplish two things. We should get a clear statement to the public about the flu outbreak from the nation's leading health authorities, and I'm pleased that our witnesses are here today to provide that. We should find out if there are other things, short-term and long-term, that con Congress can do to help in their, uh, in their current and future response. There is much that we cannot know at this point about this flu. Uh, we don't know how infection how in infectious is the virus, or how sick people will get, or how widespread it will be. But there is one thing that can be known. We're better situated to face the outbreak now than we would have been 10 years ago. Because of the public health work, the planning, the stockpiles, the building of epidemiological systems, we are better prepared to limit the reach and severity of the epidemic in the U.S. than we would have been. Fewer people will likely get sick than, in, than if this same virus had hit in uh, the ni 1990s. And there is one thing we can confidently predict. We need to do more. For uh, decades, health professionals have been warning us that we are taking the work of the public health system for granted. The system is generally understaffed, under-equipped, and underfunded. The President has requested an additional $1.5 billion to respond to this flu outbreak, and I'm sure the Congress will appropriate these funds, but that should not be the end of our efforts. We should not wait for public health emergencies to come up with ad hoc responses. Uh, we uh, should upgrade our public health programs. We should provide them with a firm and reliable foundation of funding, and I hope from this pandemic flu outbreak we can finally learn the lesson that public health work saves both money and lives. I appreciate the witnesses here, and I particularly want to thank uh, Dr. Sharfstein for being here. He was an important uh, staffer, uh, not uh, on this committee, but on the Oversight Committee. But it's a rare opportunity to have him on the other side of the table. And I'm pleased that he's here, and I'm pleased that he's in the position he is now holding. And I thank uh, the, the other two doctors for being with us as well, and we're looking forward to your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Chairman Dingell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I would, I would ask unanimous consent to assert my full statement into the record. But I'd like to look back on two things. One, the fact that we have been starving our capabilities of addressing problems of this kind. And we now are looking at the consequences of that situation. And I'd like to observe that the last time we had this kind of serious problem, we had the same kind of potential for a panicky response, which I am observing might be the case again today. The result of that was a hideous set of consequences in which the lawyers held swine flu seminars to discuss how it was that they were going to represent plaintiffs and how the situation was going to create the maximum revenue for the plaintiffs and for the lawyers. I hope that we will have a more measured, thoughtful response, bottomed on a more careful approach, and that from the past events we will learn that we have to do these things in a more sensible, prudent, provident, and continuing manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Dingle. We'll, we'll go to the witnesses. I did want to mention, though, um, that uh, a Congressman uh, Anthony Weiner, um, you know, called me last weekend 
I think you had a number of cases actually in the school in your district and asked that we have this hearing. Uh, obviously, a number of members requested it, but I did want to acknowledge his quick action, calling me on the cell phone on Sunday, um, which, uh, and his concern, obviously, because of the number of cases in the school in his district. Um, let me introduce our, uh, our panel. And this is the order you're going to be speaking. I guess it's a little different from the way you're sitting there. Uh, first, we have Rear Admiral W. Craig Vanderwagen, who is uh, a physician and assistant secretary for preparedness and response. And next is a Rear Admiral Ann Shuckett, who is also a physician and interim deputy director for the Science and Public Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And last is uh, Joshua M. Sharfstein, who is also a physician and acting commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, we're asking you to uh, basically for five-minute statements, and they become part of the record. And we'll start with, uh, with Admiral Vanderwagen. Good morning, Chairman Pallon and Representative Deal. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, visit it's on. you. I offer greetings and thanks from our new Secretary Sebelius for this opportunity to assure that both arms of the U.S. government, of the three, uh, are working together and that we can share experiences, concerns and strategies for how we will address this opportunity. Over the past week, you have seen extraordinary efforts on the part of Health and Human Services and the rest of the Federal Government. For the past five years, HHS and the U.S. Government made many investments thanks to the support of Congress uh, in the nation's preparedness for pandemic influenza. Now, while the sequence of the events that we have dealt with in the last week, and I will remind you we are talking about essentially a week ago yesterday recognizing two cases in California to now uh, phase five in the WHO environment. The events of the past week have proven the value of the efforts that you supported, which included the development of community plans, the acquisition of medical countermeasures, the development of new diagnostics, and the numerous exercises and response plans at all levels of government. I would like to take an opportunity also to acknowledge and thank Secretary Napolitano for her continued leadership in this environment. She stepped forward very effectively as the principal of federal official here, and we work under her guidance overall. Our new secretary was engaged immediately. She reported to the office yesterday morning, and in fact, she was briefed in doing press uh, discussions uh, yesterday morning almost immediately. She is actively involved and concerned about these matters and directing our activities as well. Today I am joined by my colleagues who currently serve in the HHS leading the response. I want to say just a thing or two about the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Congress in 2006 established the authority for this responsibility with the notion that this office would be the principal advisor for the Secretary on public health and medical preparedness and response for health emergencies. And indeed, that is what we are executing at this time. We are trying to work to assure that there is a coherent HHS approach to public health and medical preparedness and that our response capabilities are coordinated, that the relevant activities of all the operating divisions of Health and Human Services, Centers for Disease Control, Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health and others are being conducted in a coherent and targeted way on behalf of and subject to the authority of our new Secretary. Our office also serves as the principal entity that coordinates interagency activities between Health and Human Services and other Federal departments and agencies, the White House, and State and local officials responsible for public health, emergency and medical disaster response. In the event of a public health emergency such as the 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak or other medical disasters, Health and Human Services serves as the Federal Government's lead for all the emergency support function eight, that is the public health and medical response capabilities under the National Response Framework. As the Department's lead for that ESF-8 or emergency support function eight, our office works closely with Homeland Security and FEMA to coordinate all Federal assistance to supplement states 
territorial governments, tribal and local resources in response to public health and medical care needs. We manage the Secretary's Operations Center in the Humphrey Building so that the Secretary has moment-by-moment -moment situational awareness and the ability to lead, coordinate, and direct as appropriate the health assets that are deployed in support of states. The response and coordination for the H1N1 flu outbreak is going well. You will hear from Dr. Shuckett how our lead operational entity at this point, that is the Centers for Disease Control, is moving forward according to plan, adjusting to reality as it intrudes, but doing an exceptionally good job of moving forward to manage this event. The United States governments are focused on saving lives, slowing the transmission of the disease, and mitigating the consequences of this disease. Those are our strategic objectives. Using the guidelines prepared within our pandemic influenza playbooks and plans, we have been able to more clearly communicate our goals, objectives, and strategies to our federal, state, and local partners so that we understand what they expect, they understand what they can expect from us, and that makes a ton of difference in making operations flow and flow well. As you know, the World Health Organization raised the worldwide pandemic alert to phase five, which is characterized by confirmed person-to-person -person spread of a new influenza virus and able to cause community-level outbreaks, and Dr. Shuckett, I'm sure, will talk about that in more detail. But prior to that WHO action, we issued several key declarations, including a nationwide public health emergency declaration and four emergency use authorizations, which I think Dr. Sharfstein will talk about in his uh, discussion with you. These authorizations were issued to make certain diagnostics available to public health and medical personnel, to allow for the use of certain antiviral products and for the use of certain N95 respirators. In response to requests received from affected states, HHS recently released antiviral medications from the strategic national stockpile to a large number of states. Additionally, Health and Human Services continues to evaluate community mitigation guidelines in those areas where cases have been confirmed through laboratory analysis, and as this outbreak progresses, we will continue to assess these and other guidelines to assure that they are appropriately based on the available science. Over the coming days, we will continue to work with our federal, state, local, and international public health and medical partners to address the needs of this outbreak. Many assets, and you will hear elements of this from my two counterparts, are working to develop a vaccine for this virus. NIH, CDC, FDA, and ASPR are all working together to work this process and to avoid the very dilemma that Mr. Dingell outlined for us. We will work with several manufacturers to continue to prepare reference strains from which viral seeds for vaccine production and clinical trials can be made. We will not only focus on the immediate response requirements, but also those that may lie ahead. As this potentially becomes more of a medical care problem, we will see challenges in the medical care system. We are already actively in communication with our colleagues at the state and local level, in hospitals, in emergency rooms, and in primary care settings to anticipate the implementation of their plans for addressing these matters and how we can support, enhance, and fill gaps that may arise in that setting. With that, I will conclude my statement, and uh, you can hear from Dr. Shuckett. Thank you. I, I assume that you, I'm supposed to reference you as doctors rather than admiral. You prefer that? <laughs> okay. Dr. Shuckett? Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Ann Shuckett, the Acting Deputy Director for Science and Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and I appreciate the opportunity to update you on current steps we're taking to respond to this unique and serious influenza outbreak. Our hearts go out to the people in the communities within the United States, in Mexico, and around the world who have been impacted by this new strain of influenza virus. 
People are concerned, and we're concerned too. We're responding aggressively at the federal, state, and local levels to understand the complexities of the outbreak and to implement control measures. Our aggressive actions are possible in many respects because of the investments and the support of the committee and the Congress and the hard work of state and local officials on the front line around the country. Flu viruses are extremely unpredictable, making it hard for us to anticipate the course that this outbreak will have with any certainty. We do expect increases in the number of cases, the number of states that are affected, and the severity of illness. Amid this uncertainty, we hope to be clear in communicating what we do know and acknowledging the uncertainties, clearly communicating what we are doing to protect the health of Americans and help Americans understand the steps that they can take themselves to protect their own health and that of their families and their communities. Influenza arises from a variety of sources, and in this case, we've determined that we have a novel 2009 H1N1 virus circulating in both the U.S. and Mexico that contains genetic pieces from four different virus sources. Additional testing is being done on the virus, including a complete genetic sequencing. CDC has determined that this virus is contagious. It's spreading from human to human, similarly to seasonal influenza likely through coughing or sneezing. Sometimes people may become infected by touching something with flu virus on it and then touching their mouth or nose. There's no evidence to suggest that this virus has been found in swine in the United States, and there have been no illnesses attributed to handling or consuming pork. There's no evidence that you can get this new influenza virus from eating pork or pork products. I want to reiterate that as we look more intensively for cases, we are finding more cases. We fully expect to see not only more cases, but also a greater severity of illness. The specific numbers are less important in understanding the outbreak than the more general patterns that we observe that will help us guide our interventions. Aggressive actions are being taken here as well as abroad we're working very closely with state and local public health officials around the U.S. on the investigation and to implement control measures. We've provided both technical support on epidemiology and laboratory um, efforts for confirming cases. And we're working with the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, and the governments of Mexico and Canada on this outbreak. There's a tri-national team that's working in Mexico right now to better understand the outbreak and to enhance surveillance and lab capacity so that we can better address critical questions such as why the cases in Mexico appear to be more severe than what we're seeing initially here in the United States. And we're working very closely with other HHS and other federal partners to ensure that our efforts are coordinated and effective. CDC has issued many health advisories for individuals, healthcare practitioners, schools, and communities, and these continue to evolve as our understanding of the situation changes. On Monday, CDC issued a travel health warning for Mexico, recommending that travelers postpone non-essential travel to Mexico. We're also evaluating information from other countries and will update travel notices as necessary. As always, People with flu or flu-like symptoms should stay at home and should not attempt to travel. In fact, a key message that we have for people is that there's a role for everyone to play when an outbreak like this is occurring. At the individual level, it's important for people to understand how each of us can prevent respiratory infections. Frequent hand washing is an effective way to reduce transmission. If you're sick, stay home. I can't tell you how many times I've said that this week. If your children are sick, have a fever or a flu-like illness, they shouldn't go to school. And if you're ill, you shouldn't get on an airplane or any public transport to travel. Taking personal responsibility for these things will help reduce the spread of this new virus 
as those measures also help reduce the spread of other respiratory infections. It's also important for people to think ahead, to think about what they would do if this outbreak deepens in their community. Communities, businesses, schools, and local government should plan now for what to do if cases appear where you live or work. For example, parents should prepare for what they would do if faced with temporary school closures. We also have additional community guidance so that clinicians, laboratory scientists, and other public health officials will know what to do should they see cases in their community. All of these specific recommendations, as well as our regular updates, are posted on the CDC's website at www.cdc.gov. CDC maintains this nation's strategic national stockpile of medications for the eventuality that they may be needed in a situation such as we face today. As part of our pandemic preparedness efforts, the U.S. government has purchased extensive supplies of antiviral drugs, and our preliminary testing indicates that the virus is susceptible to the drugs we have in our stockpile. We're releasing one quarter of the state's share of antiviral drugs and personal protective equipment to help states prepare to respond to the outbreak, along with the necessary FDA emergency use authorities to facilitate their effective use. Distribution has already begun, starting with states where we already had confirmed cases, and the Department of Defense and individual states have also stockpiled these antiviral drugs. Whenever we see a novel strain of influenza, we begin the steps to work toward the development of a vaccine in case one is needed. The CDC is working to develop a vaccine seed strain specific to this novel virus, which is the first step in vaccine manufacturing. We've initiated steps so that should we need to manufacture a vaccine, we can work towards that goal very quickly. And rapid progress is being made possible through the combined forces of CDC, NIH, FDA, BARDA, and the manufacturing community. Finally, it's important to recognize that with the strong support of the Congress, there have been enormous efforts in the U.S. to prepare for this kind of outbreak and for a full pandemic. Our detection of this strain in the United States came as a result of that investment, and our enhanced surveillance and laboratory capacity are critical to understanding and mitigating this threat. While we must remain vigilant throughout this and subsequent outbreaks, it's important to recognize that at no time in our nation's history have we been more prepared to face this kind of challenge. As we face the challenges in the weeks ahead, we look forward to working closely with the subcommittee to best address the evolving situation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shuggan. Dr. Sharfstein. Thank you, Ch Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, Ranking Member Barton, Chairman Waxman, Chairman Dingell, and other members of the committee. Thank you for having this hearing. I'm Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Principal Deputy Commissioner and Acting Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA protects the public health in this type of situation by facilitating access to safe and effective human and animal drugs, human biological products, and devices. FDA is part of a team led by the Department of Health and Human Services, um, working closely with the department, our sister agencies, other U.S. government agencies, the World Health Organization, and foreign governments we are responding to this threat. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the agency's response, including our approval of several emergency use authorizations earlier this week and the efforts of several internal FDA teams. Let me turn to the emergency use authorizations. Section 564 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which was added by the Project BioShield Act of 2004, which I know came through this committee, permits the FDA commissioner to issue an emergency use authorization following a determination and declaration of a public health emergency. This allows the use of an unapproved product or an approved product for an unapproved use in a declared emergency. Dr. Sharfstein, I think some of the members are having a hard time hearing you. Just pull the mic a little closer to you. Sorry about that. Is that That's better? better, yeah. I apologize. I was talking about emergency use authorizations. And um, FDA can issue these in an emergency under four conditions. First, we have defined that the product can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. 
Second, based on the totality of the scientific evidence, it is reasonable to believe the product will be effective against the disease or condition. Third, that the known and potential benefits of the use outweigh the known and potential risks. And fourth, that there is no adequate approved and available al alternative. This past Sunday, the Acting HHS Secretary did issue a public health emergency declaration and then followed that with declarations justifying the emergency use of certain antivirals, in vitro diagnostics and personal respiratory protection devices. Let me just briefly describe these emergency use authorizations that FDA went ahead and issued as a result or following that, that declaration. Two of them pertain to drugs. Tamiflu is a drug approved, it is oseltamivir, for the treatment of uncomplicated illness due to influenza and prevention of influenza in patients one year and older. Relenza is approved to treat acute uncomplicated illness due to influenza in adults and children seven and older who have been symptomatic for less than two days and for the prevention of influenza in adults and children five years and older. One of these emergency use authorizations allows for Tamiflu also to be used to treat and prevent influenza in children under one year. In addition, under both authorizations, both of these medications may be distributed with information pertaining to emergency use to large segments of the population without complying with the label requirements that otherwise are applicable to dispense drugs. They may be distributed by a broader range of health care workers, including some public health officials and volunteers, in accordance with the state and local laws and public health emergency responses that I know are being planned around the country. The third one related to a, a PCR flu panel diagnostic test for the CDC, which allowed the CDC to distribute to public health labs around the country a diagnostic test to, to, that, that can presumptively diagnose this particular infection. And um, for all of these emergency use authorizations, the way it worked is CDC applied. We worked very closely with CDC over the weekend to make sure um, everything was there to get inf the right information to people, and then we approved them um, on Monday, starting early in the morning. Um, this particular diagnostic test amplifies the viral genetic material. Um, a positive result indicates presumptive infection. A negative result by itself does not exclude the possibility of infection. The fourth authorization. Um, permits HHS to deploy dis certain disposable respirators from the strategic national stockpile for use to reduce exposure to airborne germs. These products, when used properly and in accordance with information that is provided, may help reduce the chances of getting sick. They do not eliminate the risk of illness or death. They should always be used in conjunction with other infection control measures, such as frequent hand washing, and should be done consistently with the advice and guidance provided by the CDC and other public health authorities. Let me just turn for the last minute to talk about how FDA has organized itself to respond to this challenge. As soon as we became aware of this last week, I asked Dr. Jesse Goodman, FDA's Acting Chief Scientist and Deputy Commissioner for Scientific and Medical Programs, to coordinate and lead FDA's efforts. Dr. Goodman is a world expert in infectious disease. He previously uh, directed the Center for Biologics and has extensive experience in issues related to influenza vaccine production and evaluation. We have changed the way FDA is managed for this process. We do, we're, we are we're using an incident management approach with Dr. Goodman as the leader, which includes seven substantive teams that are cross-cutting and includes staff from across the FDA and all FDA centers. These teams work with the department, CDC, other agencies, national and international partners, and they are the vaccine team, the antiviral team, the in vitro diagnostics team, the personal protection team, the blood team, the shortage team, and the consumer protection team. We also, in the incident management approach, have an operations section, a logistics section, and a communi communication section. We have senior level health, international, and legal advisors. Let me just very briefly explain how these teams work. The vaccine team is working to facilitate the availability of a safe and effective vaccine to protect the public from the 2009 H1N1 flu virus as soon as possible. Now, having that vaccine ready is the goal of the team. There is a completely separate question, and that is going to depend on uh, the status of the uh, epidemic, of whether and who we would, would, that vaccine would be recommended for. But for FDA, we want to um, have a vaccine that is safe, effective and available as quickly as possible. Part of this team starts in the lab. We are growing the vaccine and trying to um, genetically engineer a reference strain that could be used for vaccine development. We are already preparing a reagents that will be needed 
to help manufacturers produce and test the vaccine. We are trying to think through what clinical evidence would be necessary before we can conclude that the vaccine is effective. Um, this team is working with um, BARDA and HHS to have extensive consultation with the vaccine industry um, already as this goes forward. I actually went out and met with the vaccine team earlier this week. Um, they are scientists, they are physicians, they realize how much is at stake for this country. There is the antiviral team whose goal is to identify and evaluate antiviral drugs to prevent and treat illness and to facilitate access to these medications. This is the team that led the effort to, re to review the emergency use authorizations um, uh, with CDC. There are also an extensive communication with manufacturers about other options to treat um, this uh, infection, particularly if it becomes severe, and is working very closely with other regulatory agencies around the world. This team used its expertise to identify the right dose for kids under one, and uh, we are hearing from a lot of countries around the world about um, how they did that. We have an in vitro diagnostics team that approved that test I was talking about that CDC is distributing, is already working with manufacturers on the availability of other tests, as well as current diagnostics just for basic identification of influenza. The personal protective equipment team did the mask emergency use authorization, and they are also um, in continuous contact with the key manufacturers to make sure that um, we can get uh, the appropriate supplies um, of these products for the American people. There is a blood team. The blood team is dedicated to the safety and availability of blood products needed for transfusion by the American public during this outbreak. The main focus of the blood team is to make sure there is adequate blood just in general because blood is very important for so many different uh, people and patients around the country um, and, and that, this, that the response to this uh, just doesn't reduce the number of donors. But they are also starting to think through whether there is any potential risk to the blood supply and they are engaging other regulatory agencies. So far they are not. Um, uh, the, the, there is nothing that they are recommending uh, in, in terms of particular controls based on their understanding of influenza. We have a shortage team that is working very closely with manufacturers to particularly around the issue of how they can expand production of key medications um, as well as uh, working with HHS and others about spot shortages that are occurring. And finally, we have a consumer protection team that cross cuts across all the different parts of FDA to monitor for um, scams dangerous products and things that may be uh, marketed that could cause harm to people as they are uh, worried about this situation. So in conclusion, FDA is fully committed and engaged in protecting the public's health during this difficult time. Among us are laboratory scientists, medical reviewers, epidemiologists, product experts and field inspectors. We will bring every skill and every resource we have to this critical mission. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. I welcome your ideas and your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. Thank all of the panelists. We now have five minute questions from the members, and I'll, I'll start with myself. And I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Shuckett, you mentioned the precautions people can take to protect them spell, uh, themselves, but could you elaborate uh, further? And let me just ask, what, what kinds of symptoms uh, should people be alert to? Uh, I, you know, I, naturally, people look to their families and you know, you get all kinds of things, you know, should I go to a doctor, should I wear a mask? Uh, I'm not you don't necessarily have to comment on that, but what, what are the symptoms that they should be alert to? And, and what about going to a doctor? Is it, uh, does it make sense to go to a doctor or only certain circumstances? We don't overwhelm the uh, doctor's offices either. Um, the symptoms of this new strain of influenza virus are similar to the symptoms of seasonal influenza and they include high fever, body aches, cough, sore throat, um, those sorts of things. Unfortunately, the symptoms of influenza are very nonspecific and they can be caused by lots of other things. It is important for people to use judgment. If you are really sick, you need to make sure you consult your health care provider. And if your children are ill, this, the same thing. Um, but it is also important to recognize that this is a time where we don't want the worried well flooding the emergency rooms. We, we really do need to be careful about that kind of thing. One of the emphasis areas has been diagnostic tests to help us differentiate um, this new virus from other illness. And so we are very pleased that this emergency use authorization went forward and the states are now prepared to differentiate this new flu virus from other things. But in general, mild illness, you, you really are able to stay home and self-care. Self 
um, and illness that's a little bit more severe, you want to make sure you contact your health care provider. In particular, in areas where there hasn't been any recognized disease yet, we want people to let their health care provider know if they have these sorts of symptoms and have traveled to one of the areas that's affected. Well, it's you mentioned uh, Mexico. I mean, I do, I do see, uh, well, people mention Mexico, obviously. I do see on TV, you know, people in Mexico wearing masks. I mean, that doesn't make, I mean, I, maybe it does in Mexico, but here, uh, that's a little severe, isn't it? What? You, you know, we think there are a, a variety of interventions that will help reduce the risk of respiratory infections, and um, we do th feel for the people in Mexico who are in, in a difficult circumstance now and, and really doing everything they can think of to try to protect themselves. Hmm. Here we have issued guidance for um, for the mask use for different circumstances, and we update our guidance as we get new information on our website. But I think it's important to say that guidance is going to be different in different areas. The New York City area was having an outbreak in a, a school that was fairly large, and their guidance was really targeted at w the circumstances on the ground. CDC is trying to issue guidance and updated guidance very frequently for the country, but we recognize that the local authorities have the best information on their circumstances, and we really want people to know what's going on in your own community, what do your local authorities say, and really use us as a technical support to those local entities. Okay. Let me ask Dr. Sharfstein I, uh, about the vaccination. I mean, I, I um, seem to recall, I don't know if it was at the briefing yesterday or that they said that, uh, you know, probably wouldn't be available for everyone until maybe November at the earliest, possibly not till January. I, I remember in 2004 we had, when we had a major shortage of the seasonal flu vaccine, and um, at the time the public health officials were saying that if we faced a pandemic we wouldn't have adequate vaccine capacity. Um, can you explain what the government has done to increase the vaccine manufacturing capacity? And, um, you know, where are we now? I, I mentioned that I don't know where I heard that uh, November to January. It might have been at the briefing we had yesterday, but sure. if you would um, comment on I'm, I'm happy to answer that. 2004, um, there were only about 60 million doses of vaccine for the flu that year because of the problem that one of the manufacturers had. And in addition, the infrastructure was relatively weak and there wasn't the capacity if there was a uh, pandemic to um, be making another vaccine. But because of the committee's efforts and the federal government's efforts and uh, FDA's efforts, there's been a tremendous shift since that time. Um, I'll go through a, a couple issues. One is that there was funding appropriated to strengthen the vaccine infrastructure. And one way to, to talk about that is eggs. That flu vaccine is, is made in eggs. And in 2004, there weren't extra eggs. There was just the eggs for the regular flu vaccine. Um, but HHS has gone out and uh, contracted. They have uh, extra flocks. And we've gone uh, to a year-round egg availability. So there, is, there isn't any months where eggs aren't available. So um, that reduces most of the time that people were worried about in 2004 would be the delay. On FDA's side, um, FDA aggressively went out and solicited other companies to be making the flu vaccine for the U.S. market and use an accelerated approval approach to bring online three new manufacturers. So this year, I think the capacity is around 130 or 140 million doses instead of just 60 in 2004 with additional manufacturing capacity potentially out there. and. Um, and all the companies already engaged with us in how to make the vaccine and the eggs available. I was hearing that, that we now have the capacity where we had 200,000 eggs a day only during the flu vaccine season, that that has gone up considerably, maybe as much as 500,000 eggs a day year round. So right now, the capacity in the system and the ability of the manufacturers to make um, vaccine is, is so much better than 2004. The challenge is, and why people are w talking about different dates to when it could become available, is it has to do more with the virus than anything else. Um, it has to, there are several steps to make a vaccine and test a vaccine, and each of those has its own uncertainties. If everything goes you know, extremely well, we'll all be happy, but we don't know if everything will go extremely well. You could have a problem creating the virus initially, a problem growing the virus, then when you make the vaccine, you have to test it to see whether it generates the immune response you're looking for or else it may have to be reformulated. So I think that the, the position is to, to explain is that 
the infrastructure we're building on is extremely uh, strong, particularly compared to where we were in 2004. But we're dealing with an unknown um, uh, virus, one that hasn't been turned into a vaccine before, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how that will go. But it's really a scientific uncertainty. I think the, the, the basic infrastructure to, to succeed is there. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Deal? Uh, Dr. Van der Wagen, first of all, I'd like to ask you, how did the administration arrive at the $1.5 billion as the figure that the request is made for? Uh, how would that money be distributed to which agencies? What would those agencies be allowed to use that money for? And are there other funds that HHS can currently draw on to deal with this matter? Thank you, Mr. Deal. Good question. When we analyze the potential demand for additional antivirals, we look at the cost of production of vaccine, we look at the cost of potential medical supplies should we have a wider, more severe event in the medical environment. Uh, when we look at a number of those issues, the cost requirements can be fairly significant. I think the President's intent was, given that there are all those potential uses, uh, depending upon how this thing progresses, uh, that this was a place to start. I think the majority of that would be looking at such things as additional medications, additional development, you know, associated with the vaccine and getting it to the point where we have a safe and effective vaccine and providing some support to local and state uh, requirements for preparedness. I think those are the kinds of issues that we're looking at in terms of where that, <coughs> that funding would go. And, and I can tell you. You're not that, allowed to cough during this hearing. <laughs> pardon me? I'm joking. You're not allowed to cough during this hearing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's allergies in my case. Not, I got not your problems. <laughs> so uh, uh, the universe of need could be quite large, much larger than that figure, in fact. But this is a way for us to look at some of the known things that we think we're going to need to take care of. We are currently replenishing our stockpile for those amounts. Or we're considering that. We have funds inside the department we might be able to use to cover that. So that's a decision point that we're examining right now. If we want to cover those antivirals that we've already sent to the states and replenish that, we may have funding available to us internally to do that. But beyond that, if we're going to start talking about wider uh, support to antivirals, it will be a very difficult a challenge to find funding within the existing HHS appropriations for that. So part of it would go to facilitate uh, FDA's uh, more rapid response to approving vaccines, for example, for this particular thing. That's part of what I hear you say. Is that right? Well, the short answer is yes. NIH will conduct clinical studies for safety and efficacy in partnership with FDA. Those, that takes funding support. We would be looking at beginning to develop the pilot lots. That costs money to do that particular clinical trial. The, in series, we'd be looking to try and ramp up vaccine commercial production capacity while those tests are undertaken. Those all have costs associated with them. All right. Uh, Dr. Sharstein, from the FDA point of view, um, I've been told, and I think uh, the chairman alluded to this as well, that if we are developing a vaccine specifically for the H1N1 um, uh, virus, that it could be done as a separate vaccine for that, and I've been told it would take maybe four months to get that from the time you arrive at what you think the formula needs to be, about four months to get it uh, to the production stage. Is that generally about right? I think, um, first of all, let me, let me just to follow up on, on what you said before. There may be extra funds FDA needs, but I want to assure you that everything we think needs to be done is being done. And the management structure we have in place is really pushing you know, the staff and everybody is uh, completely committed to doing everything we need to do to, to uh, meet these different goals on each team as quickly as possible. Um, the f four months is one possible scenario, but what really depends on is how the vi this virus behaves in a vaccine. And I'll just g give you an example. We've got to combine it um, with other viruses in order to get it to grow fast enough. Then it's got to eventually be grown in bulk, and then it's got to be tested in people to see how much of it um, produces an immune response. Uh, 
Um, if you do the first test and it doesn't show the right, you know, and it may be the first test has a couple different options, but based on that data, you have to look at it because our goal is both an effective vaccine and a safe vaccine. Okay. So it's going to it's going to depend. Um, since the we're not going to be waiting for eggs. That's very that that was actually the one of the biggest problems in 2004. And I we hate, go, and I hate to interrupt right you, but my time's about out. I want to ask you one other thing. My understanding is that each year in the seasonal vaccines. Um, that you choose up to maybe three different uh, strains. <clears throat> I assume this was not one of the strains that was anticipated to be included in the seasonal vaccine simply because you didn't, first of all, anticipate it, secondly, had not had the time to ramp up for it. Uh, are you so far along, I assume, in the seasonal vaccine process mm -hmm. that if you were to be able to come up with a vaccine for this, that it would not be allowed to be included in the seasonal vaccines, but would have to be a separate vaccination program? Is that a correct assumption? Um, well, that's an excellent question. Um, you're right that it was not in, in this, the flu vaccine that had been prepared because people weren't aware of the virus's existence. And right now, we're, we're, we're basically developing with the manufacturers the ability to make a vaccine. And then there has to be some strategic decisions made over the next few weeks. One of those decisions is going to be whether to make this as a standalone vaccine, to combine it with other vaccines. And that, in part, has to do with the manufacturing capacity. If you make a single standalone vaccine, you can make more of it. So, um, and in part, that's going to depend on how um, uh, how much of it you need to develop the immune response. So there are a lot of factors out there, and what FDA does is it works with CDC, the World Health Organization, and um, a, an advisory committee of experts to look at all the evidence, look at what we know about how this vaccine is it looks to us, as well as uh, what we know about the capa manufacturing capacity, and then there'll be a recommendation about how this integrates with the seasonal flu. So it might, you know, um, it's too early right now to have a, an answer, but it is an excellent question, and I think you know probably within a few weeks we'll be able to know more and be able to give a better answer. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Uh, Chairman Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Shuckett, I'd like to explore with you how this uh, virus is different uh, from other flu viruses. Uh, most people are familiar with the fact that we have an annual vaccine to deal with the uh, flu that uh, might be uh, in the flu season, and it, we're in the middle of of all uh, of all this uh, where. Uh, the, the, the flu season is pretty much over. Uh, every year, millions become ill. About 36,000 die from the regular seasonal, seasonal flu in this country. But this new H1N1 flu does appear to be different. And I still uh, I recognize we have a lot to learn, but I'm hoping you can clear up a few questions. Can you explain what the H1N1 flu is and how it's different from the seasonal flu? Is this virus easily transmitted from person to person? And do we know how dangerous this virus is? Thank you. This is a new virus that humans have not had before. There are H1N1A influenza viruses that we get every year as part of seasonal flu. But this is a new H1N1 strain that we hadn't found before in all of the banks of strains that we've looked at. It's a very unusual one. It has four genetic components in it, one that comes from swine from, North, uh, from the North America, one that comes from swine from Europe and Asia, a, a third part that has human origins, and a fourth part that has, four, uh, that has um, bird origins. So it's a very unusual virus. And we don't believe that humans have experienced it before until these cases that we're seeing. Um, it does appear to be easily transmissible in terms of the information we have already here in the United States as well as in Mexico. Um, but we don't have good information about how dangerous it is. It's a very important issue. In Mexico, we're getting more data about the severity in the U.S. We are in early days, but really trying to understand how severe it is. We're taking it very seriously. Mm -hmm. On the um, news shows, there's a constant comparison to the pandemic flu uh, of, in 1918, which did such devastation. And it's worrisome when 
we hear about this comparison because that virus affected not just the very young and very old, but also affected otherwise healthy adults. Early reports suggest that many of these uh, people who are being hospitalized in Mexico were apparently young and otherwise healthy as well. I know it's early, but can you tell us uh, in what ways this might be similar to 1918? A worrisome sign from the early reports in Mexico was the age of the patients and the apparent young, healthy adults. That, that did ring a bell from the circumstances back in 1918. So far, the cases we have had here in the United States that have been laboratory confirmed are relatively young also. I think our median age is 22 right now. But again, we are beginning to collect more information and these things could change quite a bit. There are some very different circumstances from 1918. Today we have antiviral drugs that treat flu. We also have antibiotics or antibacterial drugs that treat the kinds of secondary bacterial pneumonias that we think played a role in the 1918 devastation. We have better health care circumstances. We have much better communication and hopefully more skilled leadership who is doing the communication. One of the really important things in addressing something like this is making sure that people have good information and that our interventions are not worse than the virus itself. Mm -hmm. So even if we assume that this virus is as bad uh, as that one in 1918, these modern medical advances will be helpful in treating patients. We are not going to see the same kind of uh, uh, death and uh, terrible results that we saw then when we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have antivirals, we didn't have the whole infrastructure of communication that we now have. You know, I think that the circumstances are much better today to respond to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I also want to introduce the uncertainty that every new strain is different and we really need to learn as we go about how this one will behave. We also are um, mindful of circumstances in other parts of the world which may not be as fortunate as ours. Yeah. And would this virus possibly mutate during the next several months? Influenza viruses can mutate frequently and we need to keep our eye on them. So during the regular seasonal flu, we test strains all throughout the season. Often uh, um, we find changes in the resistance pattern of the virus. We are very happy that the original viruses, uh, uh, strains that we have tested are sensitive to the Tamiflu and Relenza that is in our stockpile, but we need to keep looking at that. And we also need to look at the antigenic or immune properties because that will feature into what vaccine may be useful. So we are, um, they do mutate and we need to keep our eye on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Uh, Mr. Gingry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just associate my, myself with the uh, comment that our Chairman Emeritus, uh, John Dingell, uh, made in his opening remarks. Uh, in regard to not overreacting to the point that we create a pandemic of panic. Uh, and I want to thank our panelists. I think already some comments have been made uh, to, to that regard. And yesterday when uh, Secretary uh, Sabidius and, and uh, Napolitano and uh, Dr. Shuckett, you were there as well, uh, it's very reassuring to members of Congress uh, to get the feeling that we indeed are prepared. Uh, the remarks that we heard from Dr. Uh, Sharfstein, of course, uh, just add to that. Uh, I feel good about it. I, th I think what occurred in, in 2003, 2004 in regard to the fear of uh, avian influenza pandemic uh, led to a $6 billion uh, emergency appropriation in, in uh, as you have pointed out, a lot of that money went toward uh, making sure that a stockpile of Tamiflu and Relenza uh, was, was beefed up uh, to something like 50 million uh, courses, not just one dose, but courses of treatment. Uh, and also the three or four pharmaceutical companies who had maybe been in the domestic uh, business of manufacturing vaccine but because of liability and uh, no reimbursement for the vaccines that were never given. Uh, it was not a very cost-effective business for them. Uh, we helped with that, with, uh, with grants and, and uh, 
uh, some of that money was spent in that way. And then it's my understanding, and this was, of course, what, what Ranking Member Deal mentioned as far as the $1.5 billion, Dr. Vanderwagen, uh, that uh, $1.3 billion of that original six is still available. Uh, and I want to want to ask this question uh, about that particular amount of money. President Obama, I think, had no choice because of the uh, he doesn't want to get Katrina, uh, you know, the media uh, frenzy uh, about this issue uh, it leaves him no choice but to say, well, look, we're not going to uh, go to sleep at the switch and we're going to appropriate this money. But if if, Dr. Sharfstein, if we decide that it is not really appropriate, not really necessary to go uh, forward with the development of that vaccine specifically against this H1N1 uh, flu, we won't call it swine flu, uh, then, uh, then maybe at some point when this is all said and done and it turns out to be a mild disease and uh, people kind of go back to their normal living and they're not shutting down schools because one child is sick and they're not uh, uh, avoiding the subways and taking commercial airline flights. I mean, you know, we're getting to the point where I fear that we're, 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 or we're getting ourselves in a frenzy uh, and it's inappropriate. Uh, so if this thing turns out not to be uh, the, the real bad pandemic that everybody fears it could be, uh, then I would hope that the money that's not spent to develop this vaccine will go back to John Q. Taxpayer, go back into the general treasury or whatever, and not uh, just just stay there and, and you know for the next 10 years so when it's really not needed. Uh, I don't want to underplay this. I'm a physician member. Uh, I don't want to have egg on my face uh, a month from now. But I do agree with Chairman uh, Emeritus Dingell that we don't want to overreact here. And I, I think Dr. Shuckett said, mentioned that yesterday and again today. And I would like for all of you to comment on that a little bit, if you would. I think it's really important to recognize the uncertainty that we have, that influenza can be very unpredictable, that the um, evolution of the situation in the past week has had many worrisome aspects, but that we are acting aggressively. And I think that we really do need to make sure that we are um, able to aggressively respond. An important issue, I think, is that the investments that were made in the past few years for pandemic preparedness have greatly strengthened our response to seasonal influenza. And as was mentioned, 36,000 Americans die every year from seasonal influenza. So it's likely that um, flexible um, programming of emergency funds would be flexibly applied to strengthening our, our work against the seasonal flu, which is such a killer in America. I, mean, um, I, I think that um, your, your point is uh, very well taken. And we heard about the analogy of the 1918 flu, but some people have also been discussing the 1976 swine flu uh, situation. And some, in looking back on that, some uh, historians have said that might have been an instance where people were um, overreacted. And uh, the lessons, I think, that were drawn from that experience was that you've got to separate out the preparation for the possible uh, worst case scenario from actually implementing it. And that people, uh, in, in looking back, felt like maybe because they had a vaccine, they had to use it. And I think it's very clear now that those two things have got to be separated. It's, um, f in the end, going to be okay if we have a vaccine, but turns out not to be a pandemic. We just don't want to be in a situation where we have a pandemic and we don't have a vaccine. Uh, and the okay. last comment, just to finish out your threesome here, sir. Uh, I think that we are now down to about 600 uh, million remaining. And most of those, as you know, we received special milestone payment authority under the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act for acquisition of materials and so on. That balance is really already sort of pre-committed as part of those milestone payments, which are going for diagnostics, new antivirals in case we develop resistance to the existing antivirals, and to support some other vaccine uh, analysis that's ongoing. So it's 
it's committed in the milestone payments stream for those products that are in development. Thank you. Um, we just have one vote. I'm going to uh, try to proceed with questions. I'm going to see if there's some way that we can work it out so that um, we don't have to break. But I don't know if that's possible. But in the meantime, if we'll proceed to Mr. D to Chairman Dingle. Thank you for your courtesy, and I commend you for the hearing. Uh, I've, I have several questions I'd like to have for the record, and I would ask unanimous consent that the responses be inserted in the record at the appropriate place and fashion. Uh, the first one, uh, who is going to be the lead agency? Is it going to be HHS, or is it going to be the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, the simple answer is for public health and medical activities, it's health and human services for the wider response if it involves energy, transportation, security, et cetera, that's all in the hands of DHS. We all work as a coherent team under their leadership. Do you have a, do you have a memorandum of understanding defining how that's going to be done? Yes, sir. There's uh, the National Response that? Framework would, with would a you very submit specific that? set of would, requirements. Would in you an please MOU. submit that for the record? Uh, how, how is this budget going to be expended? Uh, would you submit to us uh, a statement of how the money is going to be expended, um, if you please? Um, now, um, the states are going to have very severe problem. My home state of Michigan has a budget deficit which has been announced is going to go to a billion dollars after some very savage efforts to cut back on the expenditures. Uh, how much of this money, this billion and a half dollars, is going to go to the state aid states to be expended through their agencies for what purposes? You know, I, I think these matters are being evaluated and the Office of Management of Bu and Budget is intending to submit something soon with, with those types of uh, allocations. So the answer is we don't know. And I'm assuming that the answer is that you do not yet have a defined budget structure. It, 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 there's, no, there's no nod button on the reporter's response. The answer is yes. Is that right? Yes. All right. Now, um, what is the potential for this flu outbreak to reach pandemic levels? You know, the, the World Health Organization elevated the phase yesterday to phase five, which is the second highest phase. But here in the United States, we've already been acting as if it were uh, a full-blown pandemic in terms of our response, aggressively preparing for widespread disease in many communities. We don't know if that will actually happen, but we are seeing sustained transmission in a, a few communities. We don't yet have um, severe illness, but we... Or, or lots of severe illness, but we, we fear that we may have additional severe cases as we have with seasonal flu. I would like to have you submit to the committee as soon as you can what assistance the federal government is going to be providing state and local units of government to uh, enable them to address their responsibilities in, in this uh, matter of flu. And I ask unanimous consent that that be inserted in the record at the appropriate place. Um, this. I, I note that FDA is currently using three products um, whose use is being uh, vigorously monitored. The secretary was granted emergency use under the 200, uh, 2004 Project BioShield law to clear the unapproved use of particular products in the event of an emergency. The secretary is, uh, is, is exercising this authority for two drug products and one diagnostic, diagnostic test. What are the considerations in deciding to clear the products for use of young children and adults? This is Dr. Sharfstein. Thank you for the question. The, the basic considerations um, are uh, set out in the law, and then I will tell you how we applied it in this case. That First of all, there is a serious or life-threatening condition. We know that is the case. Second, that the totality of the scientific evidence makes it reasonable, reasonable to believe that the product may be effective. Third, that there's known, the, the known and potential benefits of the use outweigh the known and potential risks. And fourth, there is no adequate, approved, and available alternative. Now, for kids, the only thing that is done differently under the emergency use authorizations is for Tamiflu, where 
it permits the use under age 1. And it's, a, it's an excellent question because you think, well, how did FDA decide that that was okay? How did you figure out a dose? It was not in the original label. And it turns out that FDA has been looking at this for a couple years and has been working um, very closely with NIH and the company to get data on under age 1. And there was actually a study that was done, FDA reviewed the study and even over the weekend got, uh, got additional data from the company um, involving more than 750 infants from Japan um, and uh, also some German uh, data. There was a study that was organized out of NIH let, which um, was specifically let, targeted let, for kids under please, age. Please submit the rest of sure. your question for the answer, or rather for the record. Um, I would like to know if, you're, if your agency has a regular on-the-shelf plan to address these kinds of problems when they arise, yes or no? Mr. Um, Chairman Dingell, if I could just interrupt and, and tell the members what we are going to do is continue because of the time constraints of our public uh, health witnesses here. And uh, Ms. Uh, Capps, who is our vice chair, is going to come back and replace me so I can go vote. So you all have about uh, eight minutes left. If you want to leave now and come back, I don't mean the witnesses, I am talking about uh, the members. Right. We are just going to continue. I, I apologize for interrupting, Mr. Chairman. I will repeat the question. I would appreciate for you submitting for the record, one, the answer, do you have an on-the-shelf plan? Uh, you are nodding yes? Yes, is the answer. All right. Yes, all of us yes. do. All right. All three of you? Yes. All right. Would, and does that include uh, working with the uh, Department of Homeland Security? Yes. And do they have one? Yes. All right. Would you submit those plans to us for the record, please? Can do. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Next is uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the distinguished panelists. I'm learning a great deal here. I'm not a physician. I'm a psychologist, and I understand panic. And I need to ask you some questions, and I'm not meaning to embarrass anyone, but I think it's very important you get some official statements out for this. Is anyone from any of your departments recommending that any American citizens avoid airplanes, buses, elevators, confined spaces, or do you think that perhaps we should not be saying that right now? We are recommending that people defer non-essential travel to Mexico. We are recommending that people who are sick not get on airplanes or um, public transportation, and I, I think there may have been a misstatement. I, would you all agree with that? Well, agree. We'll, let, we'll let it stand at that. Um, but I do think it is important we let people know this is uh, every year when there is a flu in this country, many people uh, die, sadly. Uh, from that, um, and but the main thing is to understand that you're working this issue very, uh, very hard, and I appreciate what you're doing. However, it is a concern about um, any time people will use uh, transportation, and I'm wondering, as part of your plan, we have the transportation security system set up. Every airport has lots of poachers and lots of issues, and I'm wondering, as it says, if you're recommending people not travel if they're sick, um, uh, stay home if they're sick. Uh, if the airports are a particularly important area because that's where you have people who may be ill traveling across the country and spreading this, uh, is this part of your plan to also include that as a location for other public information posters perhaps at airports? And added to that, uh, anything you are advising um, airlines with regard to if they see passengers come to the airport that appear to be sick? Yes, we have been issuing both guidance as well as um, developing materials. We have also started to hand out the yellow cards, the travel health alert notices um, at, at airports and other ports for um, people who are traveling to know what signs to look for and what to do if they do become ill. Um, and we're certainly, um, work, we certainly, we actually just recently issued guidance for air, airline crews if they were caring for someone who was ill, what, what are the steps they need to take. Um, and we'll continue to update those kinds of guidances. Will this include information that uh, airport security, airport or airline workers, if they see someone who appears to be ill before they get on a plane, perhaps tell them not to fly? Yeah, that's right. We actually do um, already have quite a bit of intervention in terms of uh, um, education for the, the um, travel workers, the Customs and Border Protection uh, uh, personnel, as well as um, a good relationship with the airline industry. We've developed, we have developed a greater collaboration during the SARS 
problem um, to really be able to make sure people working in that profession could recognize the issues and address them. Uh, and, and one other thing, and open up to other uh, comments as well. Uh, certainly, we are aware um, of those things that our parents taught us. You cover your mouth if you sneeze. If you're sick, you stay home. You wash your hands. I see you have your little bottle there. You've been using that very effectively, doctor. But are there things you advise people not to do? For example, should people go out and get Tamiflu and just start taking it? Should people start taking other antibiotics if they have some in their medicine cabinet? What kind of things are not a good idea for people to do? I wonder if you could comment on that. You know, at this point, we're recommending that drugs like Tamiflu, which is an anti-flu viral or an antiviral drug against the flu, or antibiotics against bacterial infections, be taken under a doctor's advice. Are antibiotics useful at all with the flu? Influenza is a viral infection, right. and it, antibiotics treat bacterial infections. Some people suffering influenza can later develop a secondary or late Such onset pneumonia, pneumonia yeah. caused by a bacteria. So there are circumstances late on following influenza where um, antibiotic treatment might be necessary, but this would all be under um, a doctor's advice. Again, I'm asking the panel in this uh, that um, some people may call in their doctor now and saying, can you give me a prescription for antibiotics? Um, I've got some medicine cabinet. I was sick last year. Should I start taking them? What would you all advise? Prophylactic. We would, we would advise people to not self-medicate, that they should seek consultation with their physician before they take any medical intervention. And we're advising them that this is a doctor-patient relationship that has to be worked through. Uh, rather than just arbitrarily deciding to medicate yourself. You agree with that too, Doctor? Uh, th thank you. I, I appreciate that. It is, it is important that uh, we, I don't want people to take this too lightly nor too seriously. As we've had the SARS issue, as we had the avian uh, influenza issue, uh, these are good, important issues that people need to be addressing, and I do appreciate the important medical common sense information we've been sending out to Americans. Thank you so much. I would just add that people can contact their local health departments also to understand what things may be accessible. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Congressman Green for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, and again, I want to thank you. I have a district in Houston, a very urban district, and people go back and forth to Mexico literally every day. And, and, uh, but I appreciate the measured response, but also the planning, because our governor just announced a, a disaster declaration because of the issues. We have two schools now, public schools, Hamilton Middle School and, and Harvard uh, Elementary School. Because of a child, they've shut down the school. So they're uh, being very cautious, and that's the encouragement. All our districts are planning to do that, I think. Um, one of the concerns I have is that uh, because of the experience a few years ago when we didn't have the development of the regular flu vaccine, and I think Congressman Deal may have mentioned it, um, you're not recommending slowing the production of the flu vaccine that we know we typically would be receiving in the fall. This would be a separate injection if we get to that point. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's no recommendation to slow the production. Okay. However, as we understand more about the virus, the threat of the um, uh, new virus, um, that could potentially change, but it will be a decision that is made by, uh, with a lot of external input from uh, a lot of very smart people thinking about what the best balance is going to be. Okay. I know HHS is releasing 25 percent of the strategic reserve of the 50 million treatment courses for antiviral drugs, Tamiflu and Relenza, in the strategic national stockpile. It's my understanding these drugs will be available to all states, prioritizing distribution to the effective states. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, we've released 11 million of the 44 million doses that were designated for the state or project areas, and all of the states will be receiving those. Um, already 11 have either received or on en route, I think. I guess uh, my concern is in Texas we're seeing actually pharmacies who are running out because of prescriptions, and, and I'm glad that's happening. Please, please yeah, those Dr. Uh, recall that the principles under which we established that stockpile was a partnership with states, mm -hmm. and that the goal was for we in the states to be able to cover 25 percent of the population for treatment of active disease. That was the principles under which that, ac that acquisition was really driven, and most of the states bought their share 
There are a half dozen states or so that did not, but we're still providing a pro rata share to all the states <coughs> in that event. Okay. But it's, it's about treatment for people who are sick. And okay. I know Texas has 840,000 uh, seven-day courses of antiviral medication, and I've heard we qualify for an additional 650,000. Is that generally correct? Do you know on a state-by-state -state basis? You know, I, I guess actually I just want to correct what I said. What I know is that nine, we've completed the shipments to nine states and six of the states uh, completed receipt of shipments in the last 24 hours, but we're, we're you know, continuing to, to okay. work through the listing. So I don't know the doses. Okay. If you could get that information back to our, of, our office. I know Congressman Gonzalez from San Antonio would share the same concern about my colleagues on the Republican side. There's one thing I might want to mention just to be clear. Like you, know, you said that some pharmacies were um, having shortages. Yeah. And the medicine that's going into the states is going through the public health side, not directly to the pharmacies. Okay. And it's going to be up to the local and state public health plans how that medicine gets distributed. Well, I, I guess I benefit. I have a daughter who's an infectious disease fellow at University of Texas Medical Branch, and she told me Galveston, which is not our district, all the pharmacies in Galveston County were out of the, uh, the prescriptions. But I don't know about in Harris County, which is Houston, whereas Galveston is separate. Uh, what role should the state play in the distribution of these drugs? So it's going through the public health like uh, we have. And that, in fact, that's where I'm getting my information is from the State Health uh, Commission. So. You know, each of the states has a plan for how they're going to do their um, distribution. So we look to them to let um, local folks know how it's going to work. But that has been part of the state's pandemic planning efforts. In my last 49 seconds, uh, I know you answered the question on the H H1N1 vaccine and how quickly we can get a development is a couple of months. Uh, two months seems a fairly short time frame for a vaccine to, to both be tested and it's safe for individuals, whereas Tamiflu was recently relabeled to show adverse psychological effects. What precautions is the FDA taking to monitor adverse effects from this new vaccine that we're developing now? Sure. Well, just on Tamiflu, there's a team that's looking specifically at Tamiflu adverse effects. For the flu vaccine, it depends if it's, you know, from the manufacturing standpoint, there's a, there's a chance that this will just be produced according to the regular manufacturing approach, in which case, you know, every year it has to be done pretty quickly yeah. because every year the flu vaccine is different. Now, if a different approach has to be taken, that will raise different types of oversight issues. But in all those things, assuring that, you know, that the risks are outweighed by the benefits and that we think it's a safe vaccine is really the point of, of our involvement. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Blackburn of Tennessee is recognized for her questions. I want to again thank you all for your patience for being with us yesterday, uh, Dr. Shukat, and then for you all being here this morning to help answer these questions. We are concerned. I, in my district in Tennessee, now have uh, a Williamson County case and a Shelby County case. And so as you can imagine, as this started to make its way into the news last evening and this morning, I'm hearing from parents and from constituents and medical care providers and health care uh, providers with some questions. And one of the questions that has been asked of me, and if you can provide some guidance on how best to answer this, I think it would be helpful. The way the process, the way we understand the process, when a doctor takes a culture that goes to a state lab, when a state lab suspects that this culture has either the H1 or the N1, and they decide that there is probable cause, that it could be the H1N1 strand, that it comes to the CDC for confirmation, then my question is, Number one, how many of those cultures do you have waiting for confirmation? And number two, once that culture makes it to you, how long does it take for you to provide that confirmation? Part of our planning has been to make sure that we have adequate staff day and night for something like this. And the laboratory staff in the influenza division have been doing, we've had shifts through, throughout the night, throughout the weekend. Um, but we've also taken steps to increase the capacity at the state public health labs with these kits that were recently approved for shipment and started to be shipped on Monday. It was incredibly quick. So that, the, that, that um, more and more state and local areas will be able to do that confirmatory testing on site. 
we don't the, the backlog we don't we're not working with a backlog we're really okay. working around the clock to make sure that information that's so critical for local decision making is available we're we're also uh, we've made many contingency plans for the surge idea so that the state and locals have some capacity through the public health laboratory um, network and that also we've got some um, m uh, agreements with commercial labs to help with surge of specimens for sort okay, of Okay, so is it fair to say you all turn this around in a day or a matter of hours? What is the there, time frame yes, there? Yes, there, there, there are several steps. You know, a doctor will take a test and may get a positive rapid result or may get a suspicious result, forward that on to the state or local laboratory where the strain needs to grow and additional things happen, although now they have these um, PCR tests that are more rapid. At that result, things get sent to us. Sometimes the, the shipping is, is even one of the longer steps, although we've been really expediting that. And then it's several hours upon receipt in the CDC lab before a result would be available. It, it may, things may change over the days ahead as increasing numbers of cases are detected and we really need to um, um, make some triage decisions. But we, with, with, at this point, with new states wondering, do we have this or not, we're really prioritizing that kind of question that is you know, going to make a difference for a school district, for instance. Dr. Sharfstein. Sure, and to, just to follow on, CDC just did an unbelievable job basically inventing a lab test for this that could be shared with the states within you know, a couple days and FDA work with them so that all the instructions are there, all the quality assurance procedures are there. And now the State Public Health Lab Network, which was sort of created to be ready for exactly that, they have the kit. So for someone in your county, really it should go to the, low, the, the state lab and they should be, and they're the ones making the diagnosis. Those samples shouldn't even have to go to CDC anymore. And okay, that was so all done so quickly to be able to give them that capacity. That is great. So individuals should know within a day, two days, what would be the answer? That probably that? is going to depend on the policies of the state Of lab. the state. Yeah. It, okay. It, um, but, but the test itself doesn't take more than a few hours. It's a question of how they're handling the getting All right. The and you have both the public labs and the private labs involved in this process. You know, it wouldn't be the hospital labs. The public state labs or some of the bigger city labs are part of this public lab network. Some, there are a couple commercial laboratories that aren't, okay. aren't doing that special testing, but they're ready for surge of the original testing. I've got one other question, and we may not have time for you to answer it, but we've had questions from several people. This is not flu season in the U.S., and this seems to be a very strong strand. And as we move into the warmer months, it may naturally dissipate, but your expectation for when we move into flu season in November, how do we best prepare for a resurgence? Do you think it will come back? Will we have a vaccine by that time? What is the preparation strategy for next year's flu season? These are really important issues. We are um, mindful that things may look like they're getting better, but we, we might have a resurgence in the fall. Um, there are many steps being taken to anticipate that and, and part of the, the efforts of uh, evaluating production of a vaccine is with that in mind. Also looking to the southern hemisphere for what happens there because they typically have a reverse season from us. And then also understanding the evolution of the virus during the next um, bit of time. While flu season is pretty much over in most communities here in the U.S., it's not completely over everywhere. But you're right that we usually don't see cases in the summer except in people coming back from the Southern Hemisphere. And then we, um, we will be mindful in the fall. And I would say Sorry. we would like to have a vaccine um, as soon as we uh, can, can get one. And even if it, let's say you have a vaccine and it doesn't come back in the fall, that's okay. What we don't want to be in a situation is you have a serious problem and you know, you've stopped making the vaccine for some reason. So the plan is to prepare for the worst. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the vice chair of the full committee, uh, Ms. Leggett, for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to congratulate all of you and your agencies for the um, aggressive efforts and smooth preparations you're taking here. I've been on this committee now for 12 years and remember quite well the hearings that we had in 1993, 94, and 95. Uh, in fact, I've been urging our leadership to have additional hearings and 
uh, so that we could see the progress and I'm gratified to hear that we have made progress. I do have um, a few questions though about what will happen. Uh, my first question is, do we have a sense of what the incubation period of this virus is? You know, we're looking at these new cases and the numbers change day to day. Recently, I would say conservatively two to five days or maybe one to five days. Um, the, the idea is that it's a relatively rapid um, transmission from one person to another. I, I, um, w one thing I think is, is that, that uh, you know, I have a high school freshman in Denver, and I think at high schools and colleges all around the country, many of the students are concerned that if they or someone they knew went to Mexico some weeks ago, that that could still be incubating. I think that's important to say, although, of course, it can be transmitted from person to person here. Um, my second question is, um, I'm, I'm, cons I, I'm concerned um, what, about the fact that while we've come a long way over the last few years, as uh, Dr. Sharfstein was, was describing about developing the egg-based vaccines, I'm concerned that we still have not been able to move to a cell-based um, um, production. And I'm wondering if you can talk about what the status is of development of a cell-based vaccine. Sure. Um, there's been a tremendous investment in cell-based technology, and so that was done in parallel with the getting the eggs up uh, capacity up, so that the seasonal, uh, so that the egg-based vaccine could be produced relatively quickly. There are companies that make cell-based vaccines, and FDA is working uh, very closely with them. To are you working closely with them to develop cell-based vaccines around this new H1N1 virus? You know. The, yes, in the sense that we're discussing that with them, but I think that the sense that I'm getting is that because we have a licensed process for the egg vaccine and because we have the eggs, that um, we have a, a terrific potential capacity to make plenty of vaccine with with the, the traditional approach rather than have to, you know, and, and that would be our preference because we know all the steps in the process. Well, except for the fact, Doctor, that if it truly does turn into a pandemic, then having 160 million doses by next January or whenever is not going to be sufficient even for the U.S. population, much less around the world. And so it's, it's great in the short term, but ultimately we're going to need to move to that cell-based vaccine. I, uh, your point's very well taken. I think a couple things to, to say, that's why we're having the conversations with them, and that is the future, and that's why there's such an investment. But, but it's not going to be the future for this particular strain, correct? Um, I, I don't want to, I wouldn't rule that out. I think we're, that, that's under discussion, but I think that what, what I've heard from the vaccine team is that they, they believe that there's a tremendous potential, and I, it's probably, the potential is larger than 160 million doses. Um, that 160 million doses are trivalent vaccine, so meaning that three strains, okay. so but, it's actually probably somewhere around triple that. And okay, plus but, but efforts are being made to move to the cell vaccine. Absolutely. E and even with this. My correct. next question is, is there some potential that this, um, this virus could mutate in the summer months between now and the fall when we think we might see a resurgence? Dr. Shukat. Um, yeah, yes, that is possible, and that's why we'll be continuing to look at it. Just to clarify, the planning assumptions were to have capacity to be able to produce enough vaccine for 300 million people, assuming two doses. And there are lots of things to be sorted out about how much quantity we're going to need that will influence what the real capacity right. is. Right. But, but again, I'm concerned because if with, with, this, with this old egg-based technology, which, like I say, I think we've come a long way. I'm not trying to be critical, but, but if, heaven forbid, the, the virus mutates between now and the fall, then we have to develop a, a new vaccine and keep with the egg-based technology. We may not have a vaccine developed a, until next spring, and I think that's worrisome to all of us. Dr. Vanderweg. Ma'am, let me add one or two things to what uh, Dr. Sharfstein has offered you. One is we think 600 million doses is achievable in a six-month time frame. We think that's achievable both in egg-based with some cell-based augmentation. Part of Congress's investment, all the money that was talked about in flu investments, 1.3 billion went to the development of cell-based culture. I know. We have two large plants that are very late stage of construction. They're close to inspection. 
and we've made significant progress with them. Will they be ready by January? I don't know that they will exactly be ready by January, but we know from the existing infrastructure we could probably generate a monovalent 600 million doses in a six-month time frame. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would hope that these witnesses and their agencies would continue to keep this committee apprised of their development of the cell-based vaccines and their development of the do doses as we move forward in the coming months. I'd appreciate that, and I'm sure you will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, our uh, Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you. You've been spending a lot of time the last couple of days here on Capitol Hill, and it's very valuable for us to have your expertise and to be kept abreast of what's going on. A different set of questions from me, please. Uh, the recommendation for people, and I'll, I'll address this to you, Dr. Vanderweg, and all of you have comment, and, uh, but I want to just sort of go from topic to topic. I have three. Uh, 47, uh, your, the recommendation is if you have the symptoms, uh, call your health provider. 47 million Americans don't have regular access to uh, health care. It seems likely that if this progresses and becomes worse, emergency rooms and hospitals, other public places are going to be on the front line of uh, receiving all of these uh, patients because they would be the first place, the only place certain people, uh, many people could turn. Our emergency rooms are already overflowing and uh, it is clear that uh, responding to a, a pandemic would be more than they could handle under existing circumstances. Our goal now, simultaneously, is to, to work toward providing health care for all Americans, access to health care. In the meantime, um, I, I want to comment from you on uh, what kind of emergency coverage or is it, it, do you recommend a particular plan that we could speedily enact to provide coverage or uh, for, in this case of an emergency? <clears throat> well, Madam, I really appreciate your linkage between preparedness and health security and health reform because I think those are yes. intricately, they are intertwined in a way that people don't always realize, and I, I appreciate that. Medical surge is a function of people, facilities, supplies, equipment, and systems. And what we have seen with investments that Congress has appropriated to us in hospital preparedness is the emergence of systems that rely on the fact that no one place is going to be able to manage the mm -hmm. flow. So how do we work collectively to share that flow in a way that takes the burden off? We have seen extraordinarily good examples of this in a wide variety of states, Illinois, Minnesota, North Carolina, et cetera. These are best practices that have been put in place that these states have already done a significant job of analyzing people, equipment, facilities. Those are the kind of best practices we would extend to communities that are still trying to find the answer to that problem. Uh, the emergency management assistance compacts between states also offers us ways for hospital care, not so much emergency department evaluation, but for hospital care. There are good models out there and best practices that we can share with communities. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we could uh, keep this discussion going as, uh, as the days go, in, in case there is a way that we should be responsive to you as well. Right. And now, um, another challenge, uh, Dr. Chukat, uh, um, for, the, for the provider in the household, um, uh, you are calling on people to stay home if they are ill. Uh, to prevent the limit, uh, the spread of, of the H1N1 flu. But millions of people work every day but don't have any sick leave, don't have any time that they can take. And with this uh, economic uh, uncertainty, they are very reluctant to stay home from work and may go to work with symptoms or have to send their kids to school because there is no one at, uh, to stay at home. This is going to be difficult to contain the flu. Um, we do have legislation in the works, Senator Kennedy and, and, and Congresswoman DeLauro planning to reintroduce the Healthy Families Act. I am co-sponsoring it, but that, and, and that would guarantee seven, guarantee seven sick days a, a year. Uh, first of all, you could help us with support of that kind of legislation for the next <laughs> event. And maybe if you have any thoughts of what you or we could do together to respond to this crisis. You know, just just a few comments. Um, health health in the workplace and health in the family is very important. It's a central component of public health, and we did see during the SARS um, epidemic that in Canada some of the hospitals were really taxed trying to figure out how to make sure that healthcare workers, including contract employees, would stay home 
whether furloughs needed to be um, used. And it was a very difficult circumstance to make sure that health was taking a front seat and that the, the right. rules could be worked out. So we, we would just be supportive in making sure that health is, um, is addressed. Thank you. I have one final question. There's not a lot of time for it. And maybe some ongoing conversation about this is to either any of you, because workforce shortages are something that you are experiencing in every of your agencies and of all of our local and state uh, public health facilities. Um, 11,000 public health workers are, are due to be laid off because of state budget cuts, attrition over the past year. Um, this is exactly who you are depending on even as we speak for uh, solutions. Um, do you recommend uh, any suggestions for us to help you do this or to recruit more or to implement anything? Well, I, a month ago I was the local health officer in Baltimore, Maryland, working with Congressman Sarbanes and, and others. Um, and I think uh, the, your point is very well taken that a lot of the things that are being planned at the, the federal level really depend on the state and local public health authorities to implement the emergency use authorizations that we granted give a lot of um, have a very clear role for state and local in how they hand out medicines that may be important to people eventually if there's a vaccine that's going to be delivered through the public health infrastructure and ensuring that uh, that that infrastructure is strong is is extremely important and I, I know is uh, very important to the administration my time is up but there's more to talk about <laughs> thank you very much mr. chairman thank you mr. blunt Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a couple of questions here. One, I got an uh, email from my daughter late last night who lives in Kansas City, and it involves her, but it even more importantly, and uh, just as importantly, involves my grandchildren. I guess I ought to think about how I say that. And the email from her is uh, confirmed case of swine flu in Kansas City. On a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned should uh, we be? Anybody want to? give an answer to that? Yeah. You know, um, people like your daughter are concerned, and so, so are we at CDC, and so is the government. But we're taking aggressive steps to address the challenges. And we do feel that we have um, been exercising and planning for this kind of circumstance. There's lots of things everybody can do in the community, in the family, um, as well as in schools and um, uh, workplaces. And so I think that this is a serious situation and we all really need to get ready for some uncertainty to stay aware. It's great that your daughter knows exactly what's going on where she is and that guidance from the local and, and state authorities will probably help her understand what's going on there and what the next steps are if, you're, if your grandchildren's school is closed, for instance, or, or really what, well, what are the plans? Right. What about, um, it's called swine, swine flu, but w is there any, any concern about the food supply at all? I mean, I, I think it's important to clarify that, and you may have already, but if you wouldn't mind repeating that for me. Sure. Um, there's no evidence that swine in the United States have this new virus. The, um, there's no evidence that eating pork or pork products gives you this infection. Um, the, uh, USDA is aggressively looking at, um, at the issue both here and, and working with Mexico as well. And I would say that we don't have any reason to believe that um, eating pork um, gives you this particular infection. And we have no reason to believe there's any other problem in any part of the U.S. food supply. No. No, this, this isn't an infection that we think is, is foodborne. Our veterinarian colleagues over at Agriculture call this human flu. Because it doesn't occur, they don't see it in pigs, so they're calling it human flu. And, I, and we I, do I have think that's a, that's a good thing to understand because I think there is some reaction at the at the grocery store to what they think. The other question I'd have on on uh, Amy Blunt's scale of one to ten, it, it, assuming ten is is the most concerned, it seemed to me that uh, that uh, the vice president was there this morning at the ten level when he said he'd advise people not to get on planes, his own family, or even on on subways, uh, I, I, I'm sure that's not the official position of the government. Would somebody reiterate what, I, what must be for a, a repetitive uh, response, the official position of the government on that topic? We've advised people to defer non-essential travel to Mexico. We've advised people who are ill with respiratory symptoms and fever to not go to work or school and not get on an airplane or a public transport. Mm. But we do not have uh, recommendations to stay away from those um, 
transport methods if you don't have um, respiratory symptoms. And I'm looking forward to getting on an airplane later today to go back to Atlanta. Well, most most of us will most of us will get on airplanes later today too, and and to go back to Atlanta or Missouri, as I will, or other places. And uh, you know, I, I would hope that the the commerce uh, and the travel of the country. Uh, don't don't shut down based on uh, advice from uh, the government. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Blunt. Mr. Weiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just uh, pick up on that a little bit. You know, I think you'll forgive our constituents for being a little whipsawed by the news and images that they get. And I represent the district that has half of all of the confirmed cases in the country. Um, and, you know, to watch some of the imagery on television, to listen to even, even official channels, to listen to the head of the health policy at the European Commission, in theory someone who is supposed to be pretty level-headed, say it's not a question of whether people will die, but more a question of how many. Will it be hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands? You know, you'll forgive some of my constituents for wanting to get into the fetal position and bathe in Purell after hearing things like that. And let me uh, say that it is in contrast to the way you all have uh, presented yourselves and so too with the health officials in New York City who I think have made a more sober assessment. But just to put a finer point on the question Mr. Blunt asked, focusing on subways, um, to, to instruct New Yorkers to avoid the subways is to in many cases instruct them not to make a living, not to travel around their hometown. Um, it is the very way that we, we communicate with one another and the way we get to, to and from. If you are not one of the 96 confirmed cases, if you don't feel like you've got the flu, can you just say with clarity about subways, it is safe to get on a subway. We would encourage you to get on a subway. And if there was a subway to Atlanta, you'd take it. The only people we're saying um, should avoid, um, you know, crowded circumstances or, or airplanes, for instance, are people with, with fever and respiratory symptoms. Um, we also think it's important for local authorities to be the, um, the uh, giving the guidance for the community. They understand the way the, the, tr the ground truth. And we know that the New York City Health Department is fantastic and really is, is providing good guidance. Can I ask you? How good a job did the Mexicans do on letting you know what was going on? It's a report in today's Washington Post that lays out the tick-tock of notification that seems clear that the 24-hour rule was violated by a magnitude of a couple of weeks. Apparently, our Department of Health and Human Services, which oversees the CDC, found out about the Mexican outbreak about the same time the rest of us did on television on the 24th. Um, it strikes me that that window of time is valuable, and it strikes me that, in fact, um, it could have helped, well, maybe prevent some or at least gotten us a couple of weeks or a few days at least jump on this. How would you grade the Mexican response up to now? Um, the, the Mexican um, community and, and government are, are coping with a very difficult circumstance right now, and the focus of our attention is providing technical um, support to help them uh, respond to the situation. I can say that I, I don't have all the information, I don't think anyone does yet, about all the circumstances leading up to where we are. But it's important to note that increases in respiratory illness happen quite frequently and they can have lots of different explanations. And as I understand it, the original increases that they were seeing were believed to be due to um, regular influenza. Most respiratory infections don't actually get a specific diagnosis and we see lots of changes in the numbers that um, don't pan out to be anything um, quite serious. Here in the U.S., because of our investments, we promptly recognized these very unusual strains of influenza and issued a MMWR dispatch after the first two that we had seen. But I think the circumstances in Mexico right now, the, the focus really needs to be on helping with the response. Can, can I say, you know, it is traditionally the, the influenza outbreak happens in cold weather. And I know that there's some disagreement in the medical community about why exactly it is. Maybe we're all together much more. Are we rooting for a particularly hot stretch here? Would that help us? Should we be 
trying to be out of doors more? I mean, is, is the summer, the coming summer months, is it helpful to us? Is it not clear that it's helpful? I mean, what, 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 if, uh, should, if, if there's a high pollen count, does that mean that perhaps we should be more careful? Are there any weather-related indicators, since this is kind of a counterintuitive strain, it's hitting younger people more, are there things about it that we have learned so far that gives us an indication that the weather might be on our side here? You know, we think from the past and from seasonal flu that we, we don't see much uh, influenza in the summer months, and so we hope that will be the case. But every influenza expert that I hear from um, really cautions me in anything I say to remind people how unpredictable influenza can be, and as especially a new strain. So we, we do um, optimistically hope that things will get better because of the season, but we need to be attentive for the fall afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just say that it, if we can get time, that really helps with the vaccine production. And the point about the, um, how each virus is different is extremely important about vaccine production. And I think, just to clarify, I think the idea that a certain amount of vaccine will be ready in a certain amount of time, those predictions really can't be made now until we understand more about this particular vaccine, but this virus. Thank you. Um, next is the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to say how impressed I am with the response that you and your staff has made to this situation. Um, there's been a, a calmness and professionalism to it that I think is, um, is having desired an appropriate effect on the public and, and um, uh, I know that will continue, so thank you for that. I also want to echo those who are welcoming uh, Dr. Sharstein to his new position. As he indicated, we have worked together closely uh, in Baltimore. Uh, we've suffered a great loss that he's now here, but the country is, is certainly gaining by his appointment. Um, Dr. Shuckett, you mentioned, and I was intrigued by this, that the, the number of cases is not something you're so much interested in as the patterns that you see emerging. And I wondered if you could describe a little bit more what you mean by that. What, what are the patterns that you're looking for and what do those patterns tell you about the progress of this disease? You, you know, we're working closely with the, some of the state and local um, health, uh, public health officials who are on the front line of responding to this to really understand the epidemiology Who's more likely to become ill? What are the clinical characteristics of illness? How does it look like the infection is spreading? And how transmissible is it? So those are things we're, we're evaluating in some of the um, on-the-ground circumstances in the U.S. as well as with our Mexican and Canadian partners. Those types of um, investigations can help us understand what kinds of interventions will be most effective. Um, we would love those investigations to show us that disease is becoming milder, but we, we need to be ready for the idea that the disease is becoming more severe. So rather than focus too much on individual numbers, um, we know that numbers are going to be varying, that information is in flux, that we've just decided at the CDC once a day we'll update the, the numbers and we're really focusing on the actions and, and activities. And so the patterns are really at an early phase understanding where are, which populations are at the greatest risk, how transmissible is the um, virus, and then, and then that severity. Is, is it a combination of the patterns and the numbers that would also advise as to when a community ought to be taking a particular action, um, shutting the schools in a community and so forth? Right, that's right. We, you know, we, we have guidance about um, when a, there's illness in a, a confirmed illness in a school that we recommend that school be closed temporarily while things are being reevaluated. But there could be triggers that would prompt a more aggressive approach beyond that. Um, there are other community interventions such as um, eliminating mass gatherings or, or, or you mm -hmm. know, really implementing social distancing, asking people to. Um, work from home and to really avoid avoid crowds. I was in Beijing during the SARS epidemic, and they intensively instituted those, and they really helped. But that was a very different circumstance. Um, so I think the pattern will tell us whether more um, aggressive measures are needed. We're really trying to strike a balance 
and making sure the interventions are not worse than the virus because right. there's a balance in all of these interventions. Let me ask you a different question. Um, there's, a, there's been a lot of discussion and focus on sort of tracing back yeah. um, this virus to a specific geographic origin. Is that the right perspective to have? I mean, is it the case that, uh, that this disease will be appearing, as it were, spontaneously in a lot of, a number of different uh, locations? Or does it make, because when I hear people discuss they found new cases, then the next question always is, did, did you have contact with somebody who recently traveled to? Um, but that can't be the, the only dimension of the inquiry, right, right. right? Yes, that's right. I think in, in, in the initial days there was an intense focus on contact with animals and then a and then little, bit, little bit after their contact with Mexico. We're at a, a different point where there are lots of exposures that are being looked at. Um, and really the intense look for cases is so that interventions around those cases um, and, the, and where they work or, or at school can be imposed. So for those other sectors that are focusing on, you know, tracing back and where did this all start, you know, that, that can be important information for future planning. But I think the public health community here in the United States is really focusing on what we can do to reduce illness and death and slow spread, um, giving time for more definitive interventions like vaccines should we go that route. Um, and really, really taking um, the focus of our goal is to reduce illness and slow transmission, not to find the source. Right. Mr. Chairman, can I ask Dr. Sharshin to be a 15 second question? Sure. Okay, I appreciate it. My understanding is that the, um, that the flu strains we experienced this past winter um, did not respond particularly well to Tamiflu. Is that correct? Um, yes. Okay, but that we're seeing that at least initially this strain is responding. So I guess that's a lucky thing in a sense, right? Because it, it could very well be that this strain also would not be responding. And so I'm just putting that in the happy coincidence category. Is that fair to do? Yes, but okay. there, you know, there are always a few uh, qualifiers. Um, we know, uh, I think, looking at it genetically and in the lab, that it uh, looks like it, there's, there's activity against uh, the virus. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that every patient, as soon as they get it, gets better. In fact, it's, it's more effective the earlier you get it in treatment. People who are quite ill, it can set up all sorts of problems in their body that even getting rid of the virus can't help anymore. So there's a qualifier there. The other qualifier is that it's possible that a resistance may emerge. Okay. And that's something that um, I know this, the CDC is very interested in, is watching very closely. That could have recommendations for treatment that change, you know, could change recommendations for treatment. So we are starting off with some, uh, you know, a little bit of good news there, but it, it's, it's going to depend on how this whole thing un unfolds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here, but Dr. Shukat, I want to start with you and follow up on your answer to Mr. Blunt's question about uh, the reality of this virus and its impact on our food supply. You said there is no evidence that swine in the United States have this virus, which is a standard answer on the CDC website in response to concerns about food safety issues. And if you go to the um, CDC website, there is a specific question, can people catch swine flu from eating pork? And the answer says there is no says there is no evidence that swine influenza can be transmitted through food. And yet your website is the only website of all the organizations here, including the WHO, that continues to identify this as swine flu. And on the website, uh, it also makes reference to the fact that this is a new strain of flu that consists of a mix mixture of genetic material from swine, avian, and human influenza viruses. I come from a state that is leading pork producer in this country and in the world, and this outcry over the alleged connection between food safety and this virus is having an enormous economic impact on pork producers in Iowa, North Carolina, and all over this country. So is, it, is there a plan to change the website and refer to this by its appropriate 
scientific name influenza A substrain H1N1? Our new information will have the new terminology. Our communication teams are focusing on critical information for health care providers, for families, and so forth. And so we do intend to make sure that the many, many thousands of website pages that we have already put up in the past week um, become amended, but the critical focus of the, the people on, in place right now is developing the new information that people need. No, so I, we, we understand the concerns and are very mindful in our communication going forward and, and really need to, uh, uh, people are working 24 hours a day. There are communication experts in there. It, it's really, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to um, be impolite, but I want to just say that our priorities are the public health information being out there quickly and accurately and going forward we will do the best that we can and and i appreciate that no one appreciates that more than i do but i'm also concerned because i was at the congressional briefing yesterday and when you go to the cdc's website what you find is a page the first page that says swine influenza and on that page there are probably at least 10 references to swine influenza and when your agency is one of the most critical public information dispensers in the federal government, it feeds this misperception if you don't address this issue immediately. And, and my point is, is that these other agencies are not using that terminology, and it's for a reason. So I would just encourage you, knowing that you are not in charge of the communications division at CDC, to emphasize to them the importance of making that change as quickly as possible. Would you agree to do that? We will do the best that we can. Now, one of the other concerns I have is the impact on workplace safety, um, because one of the things that OSHA has done is prepared a handbook guidance on preparing workplaces for an influenza pandemic. Have any of the three of you had an opportunity to review that pamphlet to determine whether it consists of the most up-to-date information to help prepare workplace environments to deal with the potential influenza pandemic, Dr. Sharfstein? I haven't personally looked at it, but we have um, an employee health um, part of our uh, team it, it, on personal protective equipment, and I know they have been talking to OSHA. So uh, the FDA part that um, oversees devices, because that's really what it is, the mass and that sort of thing, relates uh, directly to OSHA. And I know that our team and the OSHA um, have been talking about um, the, the different authorizations that the FDA has made, how that intersects with what OSHA uh, needs to do to protect workers. Mr. Braley, yes. it, it's, uh, I think most of the elements of HHS have worked closely with OSHA, most specifically NIOSH, with the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health, which is part of the CDC, has been working extremely closely with OSHA to assure that we're aligning any health guidance that we're bringing forward out of our department gets accounted for in their documents. We've worked very closely with them on masks. We've worked very closely with them on a variety of things over the last two or three years. So I'd say we're lashed up pretty good with the OSHA folks vis-a-vis -vis assuring that we have a common message and a common set of principles. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the uh, gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our panel of witnesses today. Um, I want to uh, join uh, in the sentiments that have been expressed by some of my colleagues about uh, the very uh, good job that has been done um, identifying and tracking this outbreak and, and the communications uh, to the Congress um, as we are trying to learn more and work hand in hand with uh, you and your uh, mission. Um, I think an outbreak like this exposes the strengths and weaknesses in our uh, public health system. Uh, uh, Dr. Vanderwagen, you talked about the system as a, a sort of people, supplies, equipment, facilities, and, and systems. And, I have been working with a number of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle on uh, trying to uh, address our public health system and strengthen it in some areas where I, I, I uh, think that there are some weaknesses. I, I want to probe into two of those areas. One is um, 
uh, relating to our um, state labs of, of, of hygiene. And I, I guess I'd start with you, um, Dr. Shuckett, uh, and would like to hear your feedback on how um, it is these days working with the states to track and monitor this disease. And I ask the question because in my examination of the issue, um, and this is uh, based on a 2007 survey by the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists showing that um, 16 states are still completely paper-based, 20 uh, states are still using um, manual reporting that's web-based, and um, only two state public health laboratories in the country have bi-directional data flow um, that can both send and receive laboratory messages. Um, I understand also that technology does, is not yet deployed um, that would support new pathogen discovery and rapid electronic exchange of public health information, um, national bacterial and viral databases for DNA, fingerprinting of infectious disease organisms, things like that. If, if you tell me how things are going and how those technological upgrades being deployed in our labs might help. You know, the promise of, of information technology is huge, and unfortunately it hasn't gotten applied to public health infrastructure as, as rapidly in, as in some of the business community. And I, I think we are not where we would like to be in that area. We're, um, you know, in, during this investigation, we've just yesterday, I think, got electronic reporting from the, the states coming in, which was exciting for us because it's been a long time coming. But that's just for this investigation, not for everything. You know, there are huge opportunities in that to really increase the efficiency of how public health works. And ma'am, I would, uh, the comments I made to the member from California apply here as well, that as we think about health reform and we think about preparedness, it's not just a matter of hospital services concerns here. I think these issues are going to need to be thought through as part of that context as well. Yeah, I, let me follow up um, with some of the um, personnel challenges we're dealing with. Uh, uh, certainly as states and, and local governments have real budget squeezes, I know that they've had to shift around staff uh, in, in order to deal with this outbreak. Um, I don't have a specific question um, r right now on the, on the staffing of, of labs of public uh, uh, hygiene. Um, as I said, I'm working on bipartisan legislation. Uh, uh, we've introduced a bill called Strengthening America's Public Health Systems Act, which deals with the technology and, and the personnel there. But I, I want to focus quickly on a, another area of personnel or workforce um, shortage, uh, both present and looming, and that's with regard to public health veterinarians. Um, while, uh, while we have probably I, I want to say about 85,000 veterinarians in the nation. Um, I think uh, my figures say only a, few, a little over um, 4,000 are food animal predominant, um, some with a mixed practice. Uh, um, the number of, of veterans in public, corporate, or federal positions, which includes teaching, research, military inspection, and food safety, um, is just under 15,000. And the projections are that we will have a significant increase in demand as we move forward for these professionals and uh, a significant shortfall now and as we move forward. Mr. Uh, Dr. Vanderwagen, can you talk to us a little bit about the role of public health veterinarians in, um, with regard to this outbreak? And uh, are, you, are you seeing that the shortage of public health veterinarians in the U.S. and around the world um, is having a, an impact now? Yes, ma'am, and, and you read my eyes. My, my dad was the chief veterinarian for the state of California, and so I grew up in a home with a public health veterinarian, large animal practitioner to start. I think it's critically important that we think in terms of one medicine. There are many more species with health issues than humans. And even though we focus heavily on humans, and I think appropriately so, it's our species uh, notwithstanding that, we are at extreme risk from a variety of diseases that emerge from the animal environment. And without the kind of knowledge that public health veterinarians bring, with regards to animal-based diseases that have zoonotic, that is, transmissibility from animals to humans as an underlying principle, 
we end up flying blind on a significant number of challenges that our health security may be confronting. So I think it's critically important that we think about that workforce and that we embrace the notion that there's more to health than simply that of humans alone. Thank you. The uh, gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Van der Wagen, you can't get away from me. You noticed, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, I'll start my first question to Dr. Sharfstein. Um, on the flu panel diagnostic tests, are those available to the territories like my own and those in the, in the Caribbean and those in the Pacific? Do we have the assurance that we have the availability of those tests? Sure. I'm actually going to ask Dr. Shaka to answer that. We, uh, FDA made them available to the group that, of labs that CDC requested. I got it. Which is this network. And yes, I was just trying to verify. Um, we, we have been shipping the test kits to public health laboratories that are either part of the laboratory response network or similar public health labs. And so I don't actually know. I, I believe. It's likely, but I will need to check and we can get you that information. The idea is that the public health laboratories be able to, that have, that have gone through the appropriate training and are part of this system, be able to perform these tests. Um, I, I would suspect that ours is in Puerto Rico, um, but the Pacific is much more difficult. Right, absolutely, yeah. And they shouldn't have to go all the way to Hawaii. Um, that's, that's my concern. Uh, would you pronounce your name for me? Shook it. Shook it. Okay. So Dr. Shuket and Dr. Van der Wagen, um, and you know this already, but all during my time on the Committee on Homeland Security, I um, have been concerned about the inequities and the deficiencies in the public health system in certain parts of our country, uh, communities that are rural, Indian reservations, poor communities, communities of color, and they're very vulnerable, and it's often said that when the rest of America gets a cold, we get pneumonia. So my question is, knowing this, what special efforts are being made to ensure that these communities have what they need, given that they, their infrastructure, the, the poor inf health infrastructure in terms of hospitals have closed, less labs, less providers, what is being done to reach to these vulnerable communities? <clears throat> you know, this is a, a huge issue in, in health in general, in terms yes. of the new influenza virus investigation and response, one of the teams that we've stood up is a vulnerable populations team that's really trying to address the appropriate outreach and planning for communities that may be harder hit. Well, and Ms. Christensen, it's so good to see you again, really, because I think we have a great dialogue that's important. Um, <clears throat> with regards to the Indian country, because you know yes. that's... <laughs> and the, I see your watch and your ring. And I... <laughs> With regards to Indian country, at least for those Indian people that are provided service, funded or directly provided by Indian Health Service, they're on our daily policy calls, they're on our ESF-8 calls on a daily basis uh, so that the most recent and clear communication can be transmitted through that system to people who are dependent on those health systems. Um, the tribal leaders are actually here in town today to talk to HHS about budgetary considerations and concerns, and we will listen and respond the best we can. Thanks. Great. And Dr. Shuckett and Dr. Sharfstein, uh, you said that this virus is a new virus, but it has genetic material from four known viruses, various origins. Um, what, if anything, does this mean in terms of the severity of the illness? Uh, are predict what you would predict our possible level of prior immunity and the development of the vaccine. Do those four pieces of genetic material make any difference, make it any easier to deal with? The, the virus is, is new, new and we don't, um, it, it, although it's H1N1, it's different from the human H1N1s that are part of seasonal flu that many of us have been exposed to or have been vaccinated against uh, with right. the seasonal flu vaccine. We can't predict with certainty what this virus will do. So the four components, 
don't only help. tells us don't really help. doesn't just it just tells us it's new. Um, there's a possibility there might be some cross protection in in um, certain subpopulations, and it's the kind of thing we're looking into. But it's um, you know since we've tested many many thousands of strains that had never seen it, it's its novelty that's the most concern. And I agree completely. And the, the only thing. I would add is uh, the question has been raised uh, of whether people who got the flu vaccine this year have any extra protection against this. And um, I don't think that question has fully been answered. It's one of the things that the CDC is looking into. Um, the initial tests, which test one type of immunity, did not show any cross reactivity, but there, there's the potential there. And I think that's going to be an important question um, to answer about it. I think in general the answer is. You can understand what the virus is, but to understand how it behaves, you just have to watch how it behaves. It's just hard to determine that just from the genes alone. Okay. Well, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to add to the chorus of thanks. I think uh, that the uh, response has been um, really comprehensive. And we have on our website now a link to yours so that uh, people can get the best and the, and the latest information. And we, I think a lot of members are doing that right now. Um, we now have in Illinois um, nine. Uh, seven, 19 uh, suspected cases, is it? 17 probable cases in, uh, in Illinois. The one school that was closed in Illinois is in my, uh, my district at the, uh, at the Kilmer School. I don't know if any of those have been confirmed. Do, do you know that? Does anybody know? No, no, I don't have the details of that. I'm, and I certainly feel for the, the folks in, that, in your district who are coping with such a challenge. All right. Um, I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to ask you about um, if and when we have immunizations and uh, vaccinations for uh, for if not immunization but vaccina vaccinations. Um, most states' Medicaid programs provide some coverage for adult beneficiaries in situations like like this. Um, and some states have exempted some populations from the nominal copay, pregnant women, children. I realize that this is impacting a, a somewhat different population. Um, do you think that in certain public health problems like the current one, it would be good policy to exempt all Medicaid beneficiaries from cost sharing for vaccines and maybe for other things as, as well? that? are related to this uh, outbreak. And I'm just wondering how that might impact the numbers of people who are able to access the care that they need. Yeah, I think, and I can't answer you definitively, ma'am, but I would suggest that the considerations are that when we have this kind of an issue, it's about our population and our citizens as a whole and less about individual benefits and services, we need to think about what can and should we do to serve our whole population. That is a little different mode than the way we think about medical care and health services in the country generally, which is about care for that one-on-one -on -one patient. Here we have to assure that our whole population is protected in the face of a challenge. Does that mean we should promote a wave policy, that is for people above my pay grade, but I think there is a there is a real public health argument that says we have to think about population and not just think in terms of limited individual benefits, which would suggest that we should cover everyone right. for those threats. Uh, individuals, however, when seeking care, think about their own situation um, and, and whether or not they are covered and whether or not they should be going to the, the doctor and whether they can afford to go to the doctor. Um, and so I think we have to think about how we convey that people who may have it should seek the care that they need. Yeah, and we don't, we, you know, it's important in this kind of circumstance to um, el eliminate the barriers to people presenting who need to be um, 
either cared for or for whom interventions would need to be initiated. It's, it's been a challenge in a lot of infectious disease outbreaks where communities sort of go underground and don't want to, you know, are, are fearful about, um, about presenting for care or, or what the ability to pay. So it's, it's very difficult with infectious diseases which don't respect, you know, what insurance card you have. Exactly. And I think we, we really want to have a public health approach that will help the communities. What she said. <laughs> okay. Um, let, me, let me ask another question. Um, I'm wondering if someone can describe the process for data sharing between Mexico and the, uh, and the United States. My understanding is that um, we have a number of unanswered questions, whether Mexico is in the first or second wave of illness, the percentage of people dying from the flu compared to the percentage of people who are infected, et cetera. You know, I'm happy to say that we, uh, the CDC is part of a trinational team that is on the ground in Mexico, Mexicans, American, uh, U.S. Uh, workers and Canadians who are working on the epidemiology and laboratory aspects of investigating and responding to this um, concern. Information is getting better now. But information in this kind of um, outbreak is, is really difficult, even in the best of circumstances. Information can be sketchy at the beginning, and we need to hone in on the details. And in particular, before you have a good laboratory test, it's hard to tell what's going on with people with pneumonia or severe respiratory illness. And so one of the goals of the trinational team is to strengthen the laboratory capacity in Mexico so they can detect this new strain right there without having to ship to the U.S. or Canada or elsewhere. So I think we are... Um, getting much better information and cooperation. I mean, the cooperation has been good, but the information quality is improving by the day. Thank you. And I could just add that FDA is collaborating with the FDA equivalent in Mexico around um, some of the recommendations that have been made in the United States that would be applicable, like what the right dose is for young children. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eshu. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having uh, such a timely hearing on such an important subject. Um, I have so many things that I want to say and ask, but um, uh, this is my, my, these are, first of all, thank you for the magnificent work you do um, uh, in each one of your agencies. Uh, I think they're all parts of the uh, uh, you know, jewels in the crown of uh, America's health system uh, that needs help in so many ways. Uh, but, boy, do we depend on, uh, on the work that's done out of these agencies. Uh, here's my uh, sensibility, that people are being, and it may have been said earlier by members when I wasn't uh, here uh, when the hearing began, uh, American people are inundated by the, um, the blaring, glaring headlines. And uh, as one of the staffers said uh, behind me, uh, that uh, the only break that they had uh, from uh, from swine flu uh, was uh, Senator Specter switching parties. So that that that, that was the news break, uh, and now we're back to swine flu. I'm not diminishing uh, what all of this represents, the seriousness of it, but I I think that what people need to hear over and over again are the really common sense uh, steps um, of responsibility that they need to exercise. Um, uh, washing our hands a, a thousand times a day, uh, the coughing, the sneezing, making sure that we uh, uh, that we uh, that we cover our faces. Um, I think on this issue of uh, air travel in the United States, I'm pretty sensitive about this. I've commuted across the country now uh, every single weekend for 16 and a half years, and um, as my mother would say, I don't know who has raised some people but uh, they don't cover their faces when they sneeze or they cough. Now, this is voluntary for the airlines to say something, but if they can remind everyone to fasten their seatbelts in the eventuality that something can happen to us if there's a drop, uh, I think that that should be part of the text and that our government ask in very strong, firm tones. We don't need to pass a law on this, but I think the... Uh, uh, the director or the secretary of transportation, along with health officials, should get on the phone and have a conference call with all of the airlines and say, please, 
we are asking you to make this public health announcement at the beginning of every flight because the proximity of human beings one to another on a plane is far different. Now, I've been told that in walking down the hall, uh, one of the House doctors was telling me that if someone coughs or sneeze, uh, sneezes, it's six feet. I sit pretty close to people on the plane, so do all of you. So I, I would ask that you do that. I, I get that ball rolling, and I think that that's, uh, 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 in terms of prevention, really important. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the following, and that is in the 109th Congress, uh, Representative Rogers uh, of Michigan and myself uh, uh, introduced legislation, and we were successful in, in, uh, uh, in that it, because it became law. Uh, it was the uh, Biodefense and Pandemic Drug Development Act, called BARDA, uh, to create, you're all nodding, a new office within HHS. What's the nexus between that office, the work that it's done, and this swine flu that evidently really doesn't come from pigs? Ma'am, I'll, I'll answer that uh, fairly simply. I mean, BARDA has always worked across the department to assure that the NIH Discovery Research and the FDA uh, oversight responsibilities get brought into the mix as we ad do advanced development. Over the last four years, what has happened is that BARDA, through their funding, brought us the first licensed H5N1 vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, they brought about the kind of vaccine production changes that Dr. Sharfstein referred to, mm -hmm. uh, where we have a warm base, if you will, well, that that's would allow us news. to ramp that's up. That's very good news. Well, the, the good news was that the House uh, did, um, uh, uh, in our economic uh, recovery package, included increased funds for this, but the Senate took them out. I don't think they're going to be feeling so good about that right now with what's going on. Uh, maybe, maybe one of them is tuned into this hearing tonight when they're home sitting on their sofa. So uh, let me ask this question. We're just have uh, got four seconds left. Can you explain how the CDC and the federal government plan to administer a, 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 a flu vaccine? Uh, and given that many of those who uh, so far, from what I've read, that are, are, are infected are children, uh, is this going to be performed in schools? And it will will it be a mandatory vaccine? There are answers. Maybe those decisions. Yeah, there's the answers to only some of those questions. But this, the the states have been planning around um, countermeasure um, response assessments, and they've done exercise drills with seasonal flu vaccine in terms of how will they administer promptly, get the kind of information. So gonna, you're saying they're, they'll probably use that same model. Correct. And, mm -hmm. and they're also uh, making sure they have ways to find out who's gotten one dose because there's a good chance you'll need two doses of this. So there, there, there are, you know, state-based planning mm -hmm. efforts around those models. Okay. Well, again, Mr. Chairman, this is a timely hearing. I thank all of you, the great professionals, health professionals, professionals of our country. Um, and um, uh, we've learned a lot today. And uh, I think we really have to be very sensible about this as the science and the sci scientists and the, and the um, uh, medical community uh, take the lead. Uh, but we just have to hammer home what people can do uh, to be responsible all day long, every day. And I, I think that's going to equip them with uh, a sense of uh, a little, some sense of reassurance on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eshoo. Uh, the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much uh, for your testimony and even more importantly for what you're doing to, uh, to try and deal with this uh, situation and, and um, keep, our, keep the public safe. Um, I come from Ohio. We have one confirmed case, and it's in my district. Uh, the case arises in a child who traveled with his family to Mexico. And um, the situation oh, over spring break, and um, the situation is that the school has been closed. And I know that the CDC, Dr. Shuket, recommends um, the, the the language I see here uh, recommends strong consideration of school clo closure of schools with a confirmed case or a suspected case that has been epidemiologically linked to a confirmed case. Um, 
The first question I have is why do you stop short of saying close the school? You know, I do think that we, we um, are evolving our guidance over time and some things may become clearer or stronger over time. At the, um, at the time of the initial drafting of guidance, there was quite a bit of debate because illness that we had been seeing was fairly mild and there was a question of balance. Um, I think it's really, I think it's in there, but we, we meant to have in the, in the guidance information about the, the local authorities having the, the, best, uh, the best information or respecting their ability to make decisions that were either more um, stringent or less stringent than ours. Um, but I, I do think at this point we think it's very prudent to close schools where a, a case has been uh, confirmed or is highly suspect um, to be it, until we have more time to understand what's going on. Um, so we are uh, probably a little bit more aggressive than when, when the, that was written. Okay. And um, to follow up, I should say that the superintendent in the school district did close the school, so I, I commend him um, strongly for doing that. Um, this is a, a case that, uh, as I say, a, a child traveling with their family, there are other siblings who go to other schools who are not, um, you know, exhibiting the, the symptoms of of uh, the, the uh, swine flu, um, what is the recommendation there on the on that situation? Right at the present time, what we've suggested is um, that the the intervention be targeted at the school where the child with illness is. That um, ad additionally, that um, gatherings associated with that facility be closed. But recognizing that there's a lot of variation in local uh, realities. Um, a, school, um, a, a school district in New York City is very different than a school, school district in a small town. And really respecting the ability of the local authorities to assess the situation and the practicality, mm -hmm. the issues of what's possible. We really want to make sure that our interventions are not having more mm -hmm. adverse impact than the virus itself. But we also are being mindful that we don't know as much as we want to know so far about this particular virus, and we're probably being um, more aggressive than mm -hmm. others would think we should be in order to protect uh, people. And isn't it correct that uh, unless a person is is exhibiting the symptoms themselves, they are uh, you know the, the danger of transmission is is not uh, present. You know, un unfortunately, there there are no absolutes. Um, and uh, what we think about from seasonal flu is that you, you may be able to spread infection a day before you have symptoms yourself. Okay. And so, you know, it's one of those circumstances where we wish it were simple and we wish there was a very specific symptom and we wish that everyone who is infectious knows they're infectious and can stop from spreading to others. But we're at early days with this virus. It's a new one. And we don't know whether it will be most infectious uh, later on in illness or, or what. With the SARS epidemic, we were really fortunate actually that most, the, the, most of the spread occurred when people were really, really sick, not in those early days. But when you have infections that are transmissible before they're symptom, symptomatic, before a person's symptomatic, those are really tricky. And, and that's the case with measles, in fact. People think that if I don't vaccinate my child, it's okay and my child can't spread the infection to somebody else. I'll know when they're sick and keep them home, but you can actually spread measles before you even know you have it. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of those challenges with infectious diseases and why we're, we're being pretty aggressive in our, in, our, in our interventions now. Okay, and if I could, um, this goes back to a lot of what we've heard here about um, common sense, of, about uh, you know, people staying home when they're sick and, and, and the like, but you know, the people I represent, they're hardworking people, and they're not, uh, they're not, they don't, they don't stay at home with a, with a sneeze because you, you just, you know, it's very difficult. But could you, um, could you just explain and, and, and stress um, the, the importance of people who aren't feeling well um, staying home, their kids staying home, and, um, and frankly, you know, the, the, the implications to employers, too, and why it's to their benefit that, obviously um, those folks stay home. Some of the interventions that we're recommending are inconvenient. We actually did an effort um, uh, in our planning um, a couple years ago 
to address the public. We did public engagement in several communities to understand what people, average citizens, were willing to do if there were risks of something like a, a pandemic happening. What was the trade-off in terms of personal uh, flexibilities and, and then the social protections? And through that, we learned that there was support for many more aspects, I think, of this community mitigation strategy than I think some of us would have expected. And, um, but there's a balance, and we'd really like to understand what is the severity, what is likely to be happening um, before we really um, reduce um, people's, people's lives, you know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this completes our questioning, but I just really want to thank you again for being here. I thought it was very helpful to us. Um, you know, you heard several members say that they'd like you to keep in touch with us, but certainly I'll, I'll express that as well. Um, hopefully, uh, things do not, uh, you know, uh, really get to the pandemic stage, but obviously if it, we might at some point ask you to come back again. I hope that's not necessary. Um, we also have a policy where uh, probably within the next 10 days you could get additional questions from members to answer in writing, and so we'd appreciate a response. But again, thank you very much, and uh, Godspeed in what you're doing. And without uh, further objection, uh, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned. Thank you.